So good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Kane, Superintendent of Schools, and so glad to have all of you here with us today as we proceed with the oath of office for our new school board members. It's such a critically important role uh, that our board members take on in order to ensure that they govern our school district appropriately and ensure the best opportunities for our students as well as for our employees and our school community in general. So we welcome them. We're going to go ahead and get started started right away and we're going to turn over this program right now to Ms. Katherine Hager who is the Queen Anne's County Deputy Clerk of Court. So we'll go ahead with you Ms. Hager. Thank you Dr. Kane. Um, my name is Katherine Hager and I'm now the Clerk of Court for Queen Anne's County. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So welcome board members. Michelle, if you could come down, please. We'll administer your oath first. Okay, hey, Michelle, I'm going to read your oath, um, your commission to you first before we do the oath. So to Michelle Lynn Morissette of Queen Anne's County, greetings be it known that the people of Queen Anne's County, reposing great trust and confidence in your integrity and wisdom, did on the 6th day of November 2018 elect you Board of Education for Commissioner District 1. You are therefore to execute the said office justly, honestly, diligently, and faithfully according to law and hold the same for a term of four years beginning on December 3rd, 2018, or until you shall be duly discharged therefrom. Given under my hand in the Great Seal of Maryland, Lawrence J. Hogan, Jr., Governor of the State of Maryland, on the 20th, 7th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2018. If you could please raise your right hand and repeat after me and insert your name after I. I, I Michelle Morissette, do, swear do swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and that I will be faithful and, that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance, and bear true allegiance to, the to the state of Maryland and support the Constitution and, the, Constitution and, the, laws and the laws thereof and that I will, that I will to the best of my skill and judgment, Diligently and, faithfully, diligently and faithfully, without partiality or prejudice, partiality or prejudice execute, the office, execute the office of member, of member of Queen Anne's County Board of Education, of County Board of Education according, to the according to the Constitution and laws of this state. Of this state. Congratulations. Carrie Lee O'Connor. And Carrie, I'm going to read your commission. To Carrie Lee O'Connor of Queen Anne's County, greetings be it known that the people of Queen Anne's County, reposing great trust and confidence in your integrity and wisdom, did on the 6th day of November 2018 elect you to the Board of Education for Commissioner District 2. You are therefore to execute the said office justly, honestly, diligently, and faithfully according to law and hold the same for a term of four years beginning on December 3, 2018 or until you are duly discharged therefrom. Given under my hand in the Great Seal of Maryland, Lawrence J. Hogan, Jr., Governor of the State of Maryland, on this 20th, 7th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2018. Can you raise your right hand and repeat after repeat your 
after me and insert your name after I. I, I Carrie Lee O'Connor, do, do swear that I will support the Constitution, that I will support the Constitution of, the United States, of the United States and that I will be faithful, and, that I will be faithful and, bear and bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland, state of Maryland and support the Constitution and, the Constitution and, laws, thereof, and laws thereof and that I will to the best of my skill and judgment, to the best of my skill and judgment diligently, and faithfully, diligently and faithfully, without partiality or prejudice, without partiality or prejudice execute, the office execute the office of member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education according to the Constitution and laws of this state. And laws of this state. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> Say a few words. Oh no. Oh, okay. <laughs> you need to sign. Just have my girls take a quick photo with me. <laughs> they already did a part of this journey. And they're glad to stop eating hamburger helpers after the campaign. <laughs> Tammy Harper. To Tammy Harper of Stevensville, Maryland, greeting, be it known that the people of Queen Anne's County, reposing great trust and confidence in your integrity and wisdom, did on the sixth day of November, 2018, elect you to the Board of Education. You are therefore to execute the said office justly honestly, diligently, and faithfully, according to law, and hold the same for a term of four years, beginning on December 3, 2018, or until you, are, you shall be duly discharged therefrom. Given under my hand in the Great Seal of Maryland, Lawrence J. Hogan, Jr., Governor of the State of Maryland, on this 27th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2018. Please raise your right hand and search your name after I. 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 Tamara Lehman Harper. Do swear. Do swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And that I will be faithful. And that I will be faithful. And bear true allegiance. And bear true allegiance. To the state of Maryland. To the state of Maryland. And support the Constitution. Support, support the Constitution. And laws thereof. And laws thereof. And that I will. And that I will. To the best of my skill and judgment. Diligently and faithfully, diligently and faithfully, without partiality or prejudice, without partiality or prejudice, execute the office, execute the office of member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education, as member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education, according to the Constitution, according to the Constitution, and laws of this state, and the laws of this great state. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Would you, you like to say anything? No. Okay. How do we get some? Do you want to come up with a picture of me? Say that. 
Bring your thing. Well, congratulations, new board members. Thank you for letting me attend tonight. <laughs> I know it was not optional. <laughs> right. I would like to ask all the new board members if they have anything to say. Public, go ahead. Feel free. I'm grateful and humbled to be here. Yeah, me too. It was an honor to be um, appointed by Governor Hogan, but it's a different layer of an honor to actually be elected. So. It's amazing, and I thought I knew this county until I campaigned and I got on foot, and I came to understand this county in a, in a unique and different way, and I think that that was so helpful in, in doing what I can do for our student population. So thank you. It's just an honor. I'm just very excited to be here and get started to get to work, and uh, growing up in this community, this is my chance to give back. Welcome, ladies. Yes, and welcome to each and every one of you. We are so looking forward, on behalf of my executive staff and myself, we are so looking forward to working with you. And you said it. We have work to do, and we are excited to have you on board so that we can get started. So thank you very much, and congratulations. At this time, we'll have refreshments, and, and we'll mill around and take more photos, if you'd <coughs> like, uh, till about um, 5.30. And at 5.30, we'll uh, reconvene. So please join us for some refreshments thank you welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting pursuant to the general provision article 3-305 and 3-104 I move we go into closed session to discuss and consider matters that relate to negotiations to discuss the appointment employment assignment promotion discipline demotion compensation removal resignation or performance evaluation of appointees employees or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction and also to consult with council we will be back a second oh sorry. I second she says I'm okay. 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 Dr. King oh, you I'll oh, sorry. <laughs> council No, we aren't taking it. Oh. You just say all in favor. Oh, I apologize. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any we'll nays? <coughs> no? We will be back at 6.15. Reconvene at 6.15. Good evening, and welcome to the December 5th board, school board meeting. This is a public meeting that's being videotaped for citizen, county citizens to review on QAC TV 7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the information table. During this meeting, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations and comments outside the meeting room. We'll now stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And may we take a moment of silence to recognize uh, former President Bush. Thank you. So, yeah, we'll do the election first. So item 2.2, seating of our board members. On November 6th, Ms. Carrie O'Connor, Ms. Tamara Harper, and Ms. Michelle Morissette were elected to serve as members of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education. This afternoon, Ms. Catherine Hager, Queen Anne's County Chief Deputy Clerk, guided them through their oath of office. Board members, you have taken your oath of office set forth by the Queen Anne's County Deputy Clerk of Court. 
You are now hereby seated as members of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education to serve a four-year term ending in November 2022. We are so happy to have you on board. We welcome you and we congratulate you and we are looking forward to working closely with you. So congratulations. Welcome ladies. At this time, we'll have election of our uh, board leadership. According to section 4-102 of the education article, at our first meeting in December, we must elect board leadership. Board members, may I have a motion to proceed with the election of Office of Board President? So moved. Second. It is moved by Ms. Harper and seconded by Ms. Harlow that we proceed with the election of offices. Board members, please respond when Ms. Wright calls your name. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Captain Kelly? Aye. Yes. Ms. Lissette? Yes. Ms. O'Connor? Yes. At this time, are there any nominations for the Office of Board President? I nominate Captain Beverly Kelly for the President of the Board of Education for Queen Anne's County. Who will second the nomination? Also. Are there other... Um, I, can nominate. I was going to ask yeah. if there are <laughs> other nominations for the Office of Board President? I nominate Sharon Harlow for the Office of President. Is there a second? there a second okay <coughs> nominations for the nomination for the board president has been moved and seconded uh, for Bev Kelly since there is only one and because there is only one we are going to do a um, paper ballot so we'll elect our board president by paper ballot this evening each of our board members has a ballot and on that ballot for board president you will make your vote. After you've made your vote, vote please pass your ballot to Miss Wright. Mrs. Wright. You should have all five. I'd like to congratulate our new board president is going to be Captain Beverly Kelly. So congratulations to Captain Kelly. Thank you. And at this point, I will now turn the meeting over to Captain Kelly, our new board president. I so look forward to working with you, Captain Kelly. I am going to turn this gavel over to you with pleasure. But you did such a good job. <laughs> Okay, the next item on the agenda is the election of the board vice president. Uh, do we have any nominations for board vice president? Yes, I'd like to nominate Ms. Tammy Harper for our board vice president, Queens County Board of Education. Ms. Harper has been nominated. Is there a second? Second. Okay, and are there any other nominations for board vice president? I'd like to nominate Sharon Harlow for board vice president of Queen Anne's County Board of Education. Is there a second? Yes. Pause here just a minute. We're um, conferring with council.
second. Okay, any other nominations? Okay, we have two nominations for board vice president, Ms. Harper and Ms. Harlow. You all have a sheet there to do a um, secret ballot. Please fill out your ballot and turn them over to Ms. Wright. Um, Ms. Harlow. So I'm uh, pleased to announce the vice president been selected, Ms. Tammy Harper. Congratulations, Tammy. <laughs> Next item on our um, agenda is uh, response by board leadership. And um, I have one item I wanted to mention. I very much appreciate getting elected um, board president. I've been wanting to do this for a while um, with seven and a half years on the board. I'm very excited to do this. I promise you all I have four primary goals that I thought about if I was elected. And the first one is positive. I'd like to make everybody here on the board and in the public feel um, like um, the experience we've had on the board and our meetings on the board are enjoyable, effective, and successful. And um, I'd like to have some camaraderie and feel good about our work and our accomplishments of what we do for the students and the citizens of Queen Anne's County. I'd really like us, number two, to be professional. Professionalism shows the public that we are prepared. We know what we're doing. Um, we can make decisions on issues and challenges facing us. And professional meetings give the public confidence, I think, in our abilities to make the best possible decisions in a collaborative effort in a collaborative manner. Third thing, there's only four, is teamwork. Um, to me, that's the most effective way to operate. Um, all five board members should be able to express their views with confidence that their thoughts and reasons will be heard and considered in the final decision. In my experience in leadership positions in the military, I always appreciate clear, strong counterpoints to my views. Um, these are essential to our success in making the best overall decisions for our students and the community. Um, I never liked it when everybody always agreed with me. Uh, it's smart that we listen to opposite opinions. And finally, I would like us to move forward, not dwell on the past. I'm done with the past. We have a lot of work to do, and I really look forward to us getting on with it. So thank you very much, board members. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Beth. Um, we have done response by, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, okay, approval agenda. I make a motion that we amend the agenda to move item 10.01 to 9.03, policy development number 110, to current action items in order to put this policy out to read on the website for its second read. Second. We have a motion and a second to I make so. that agenda change. Um, do we have any discussion? I just want to say that um, we've been working very hard on our policy improvement, and I'm glad to see us making some progress. And this will be the first policy under our new process that does make it to our website for community comment. We welcome your input. And I'd like to say thank you to um, um, both Ms. O'Connor and uh, Ms. Ms. Harlow to working so hard on this policy issue. Um, and we will work on that with the, in the, when it comes up in the agenda. We'll go through it. Um, so we have a, a for, um, motion and a second is uh, Ms. Ms. Wright will call the roll. Sorry. For the, can I have clarification? We are voting on the amendment. 
Are we voting on the amendment to the to agenda? move it to current items. Thank you. Well, please when I call your name. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Marcette? Yes. Thank you. Okay, the amend uh, amendment is, passes, and do we have any more amendments? Actually, we do. I'm also going to ask to amend the agenda to move our student board members' reports um, up to community involvement. I'm not sure of the number. Hold on. 4.01 um, moving up. Um, 4.04 to 4.00 to, to move our student board members' um, reports forward a little bit in the agenda. For time constraints. So moved. So we have, is there a second? Second. So we have a motion and a second to move the student board member reports item 4.04 .04 up to item 4.00, just a right under, still under community involvement. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Ms. Wright will call the roll. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. 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 So the amendment passes. We have two amendments uh, to our agenda. So I need a motion to accept the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Oh, second. Sorry. So I have a motion and a second to amend the agenda um, to um, to accept the agenda as amended. <coughs> Ms. Wright. Yes. Ms. Harlow. Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Mossett? Yes. Ms. O'Connor? Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh -huh. So the agenda is, is accepted as amended. Next thing on the last housekeeping, folks, um, is the approval of the minutes. I need, an, I need a motion to approve the open and close amendments for November 7th minutes. and November 19th. Yes. I'm sorry, did I, what did I say? <laughs> Min <laughs> minutes, I'm sorry. For uh, November 7 and November 19. So, so moved. moved. A second on it. Okay, I have a motion and a second for the approval of the minutes open and closed for November 7th and November 19th. All in favor? Ms. Wright will. Members, please respond when I call your name. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Harper? Sustain. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Sustain. Ms. O'Connor? Yes. Thank you. So the minutes are approved. Now we have a recognitions. Dr. King. Yes, we do. We have three recognitions tonight, our Spirit Award, our Energizer Money, and our Shining Star. So if board members would join me down front. All right, so good evening once again. We'll start with our Spirit Award. The Spirit Award recognizes an employee who is enthusiastic about his or her job and our school system. And tonight's recipient is Ms. Laura Schroyer, Behavior Specialist at Graysonville Elementary. Ms. Schroyer, come forward, please. Congratulations, join me right up front. Okay. Ms. Tiara Rhodes, teacher specialist at Graysonville Elementary School, nominated Ms. Schroyer, and here is what she had to say about you. When I think of someone who shows passion every day about his or her job, Mrs. Schroyer comes to mind. Mrs. Schroyer's daily routines and duties start on the foundation of building relationships with others. She makes time to foster so many positive relationships with some of our most challenging students. Students. Ms. Schroyer not only meets with each of these identified students for various activities throughout the day, such as breakfast buddies, lunch buddies, morning meetings, and cool down times, but she makes herself available to every teacher in the building as well. 
She is always ready and willing to lend a helping hand and goes the extra mile with all she encounters. Ms. Schroyer's attitude is always a positive one, even in some of the toughest situations, and I have been there with some tough situations, and uh, she is just an outstanding individual. Her optimistic mindset is infectious and shines as she co-chairs the PBIS events and incentives. Mrs. Schroyer starts the year with the new and exciting activities for our students and continues to gather their feedback for improvement. Her talents and enthusiastic disposition spills over into the community as well. As she volunteers her time after school, coaching the Kent Island High School cheer team, we're lucky to work with such a wonderful person at Graysonville Elementary School, and she is truly deserving of this award. Congratulations. <laughs> So we have an, uh, a certificate for you. And tell us who you have with us with you today. I have my husband, Chad. <laughs> Come on down, Chad. Chad. <laughs> <laughs> and your principal is here. Yes. All right. Miss Camp. Camp is here. Come on down. Anybody else you want to recognize? Um, I would say uh, Miss Rhodes, maybe. Miss Rhodes, who nominated Ms. Rhodes me. Is and then. Here. Come on down. My partner in crime, Miss Barry, I have to bring up. <laughs> it, it's all in the family. Come on and join us. Yes, the more the merrier. You can you can bring your little one. It's we're school system. We take everybody. <laughs> So our next award is the Energizer Bunny Award, and we are missing um, Chip Brittingham and Wayne Humphreys. But um, they couldn't be here tonight, but we're going to do a good job in representing them. So the Energizer Bunny Award is given to a staff member or volunteer who rises to the occasion and just keeps on going and going and going. And again, this award is sponsored by Bayview Financial through Chip Brittingham, Wayne Humphreys, and Mark Humphreys. The recipient of this month's Energizer Bunny Award goes to Mrs. Shannon Berry, guidance counselor at Graysonville. Elementary. Very good. And again, Mrs. Tierra Rhodes, teacher specialist at Graysonville Elementary, nominated you, Ms. Barry, for this award. And this is what she had to say about you. Mrs. Barry is the true definition of what it means to energize. Not only is she a working mom of three little ones, and we see all three of them here today, but she also serves as a stand-in mom for students at Graysonville Elementary School whenever the situation calls for it. Mrs. Barry is someone you always see on on the go. She leads and plans the Student of the Month assemblies, co-chairs the PBIS team, and still finds time to go to every classroom at least twice a month for various lessons. Mrs. Berry not only leads, but she also helps develop leaders in uh, the students and the community. She facilitates the student government and student-led morning announcements through hands-on coaching and gives incredible feedback. She also reaches out to the community to provide our students with equitable representation of character counts coaches, school volunteers, and career day presenters, just to name a few. Mrs. Berry also gives her time to any student or teacher in need of guidance, encouragement, motivation, or cheering up. And she does all this with an upbeat attitude and a smile on her face, just as she has right now. We're fortunate to have Mrs. Berry at Graysonville Elementary School. Congratulations to you. And we're going to ask Miss Barry, who would you like to come forward um, today? Well, I have Weston here, and my husband Justin, my son JD, and Quinn, who are both Graysonville students. And then Mrs. Schroyer, my partner in crime, come on up. Mrs. Camp and Mrs. Rhodes, thank you, Mrs. Rhodes, I appreciate it.
And last but certainly not least, our last award tonight, Shining Star Award. The Shining Star Award recognizes a Queen Anne's County Public School support person who shines in their duties while on the job. Tonight's recipient of the Shining Star Award is Mrs. Pamela Donahue, paraprofessional in the special education department. The special education team at Graysonville Elementary nominated Mrs. Donahue. Mrs. Donahue goes above and beyond for the special education department staff as well as the students entrusted in her care. Patient, flexible, and dedicated are just a few words used to describe Mrs. Donahue. She is also smart, attentive, and caring when working with various learners, levels of learners within the classroom setting. She is able to quickly problem solve without asking for advice. Mrs. Donahue is always willing to lend a helping hand to the students and teachers and gives naturally of herself and her talents. She's loved by her students and staff at Graysonville Elementary and radio radiates positive energy. Every school needs an army of Mrs. Donahue's to make a difference with students and staff. Congratulations, Mrs. Donahue. And who do you have with you tonight that you'd like to have come down? I have my husband, Patrick. Patrick, my come son, on down. James, my daughter, Stephanie, and really, all the employees <laughs> at Graysonville Elementary School are my family yes, as well. <laughs> and, you, and you had a fan club uh, back there, so they can come on down and join us in the picture. Come on down. We'd love to have you. Please, don't be bashful. Come on down. <laughs> I'll repeat it. Miss D- Donahue says that she has only been at Graysonville, is that correct? And for 13 years. And that's why you have such a huge group of supporters and fans. Congratulations to all the winners, and um, basically you've earned it all. Um, and you, yeah, please feel free to go if you have a family and you need to go. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our community involvement. Uh, the first one is 4.00 student board member reports, and we'll start with Ken Island. Hi everyone, my name is Marissa Teddy. I represent Ken Island High School. Mrs. Mammis' marketing class collected 5,580 cans in two weeks, which is amazing because their goal was only 3,500. And so this 5,580 cans collected 6,214 meals for people in the state of Maryland. So the cans were donated to Maryland Food Bank, Feed a Family, and local food pantries. Um, National Honor Society, um, they collected cans and boxes for 14 families in the county for Thanksgiving, so that was amazing as well. Um, On December 6th, Salisbury University will come on campus to deliver admissions acceptances. Students are admitted that day, so they'll find out if they got in. Um, In November, Ken Island High School hosted a successful code drive to be donated to Haven Ministries, so the codes will be counted tomorrow and sorted. Um, 
The dance class will have their showcase on December 12th at 7 p.m. The French National Honor Society induction will be December 13th at 6.30 p.m. The winter band concert will be December 19th at 7 p.m. Quarter two interims are sent out on December 19th. On December 21st, Ken Island High School hosts their student of the month celebration. And right after break, park testing begins. Thus far, approximately 500 transcripts have been requested to the guidance office, which is equivalent to 500 applications that seniors have sent out to colleges. So congratulations to everyone. Um, I'm Ariel Miles. I represent Queen Anne's County High School. Um, so before Thanksgiving break, some of you may have heard Chris Heron came and spoke to our school about um, drug abuse um, and addiction. And I take every chance I can to brag about my school. He said that we were by far the quietest gym that he has ever spoken to all the years that he's been speaking. So it was pretty cool. Um, winter sports are underway. Um, our first indoor track meet is Saturday. Basketball has their first game Thursday against Stephen Decatur, so that's pretty cool. Um, the annual Christmas parade will be on Friday, and you can see all of us on our float if you attend. Um, John Hopkins Children's Center Toy Drive is happening right now through December 13th. You can donate gifts and money to Centerville Elementary School, Kennard Elementary School, Queen Anne's County High School, and the Ken Island Elks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, high schoolers. They, um, I now have a high schooler, and I know you have homework, so whenever you feel like you need to, to go, please, please don't hesitate. That is obviously more important to us. <laughs> okay. Um, Next thing is uh, school board involvement for the new members. Um, we start. We had this for a while. We we laid off of it. Now we're reinstating it. Where, if we have multiple things that we have to do, multiple events to go to, um, it gets real hectic around Christmas time. So we we really would appreciate you all attempting to go to um, some of them. You don't have to go to all of them. It's just a lot of work to to get to every event but superintendent will, is gonna be keeping us informed of the events coming up. And this is the point where you can share with the community what you've done um, in the last month. Sometimes you may do nothing because your personal schedule is crazy. We're okay with that. Um, but other times I think it's important for the community to realize all the work that a, a board member does do. So we thought it was important to, um, to reinstate this on the agenda. So I'm not pressuring you to, to say anything this time. I caught it on the, uh, ag on the agenda um, that when I was reading ahead and realized that we're reinstating it. So if you did have something you wanted, the ones that have been around for a while had something they'd like to add in, please don't hesitate. And please don't feel bad if you have nothing to say because sometimes that just happens. And um, holidays come up and so I just, I just wanted to tell you we wanted to reinstate that. And that's for the benefit of the public in particular to know what you've been doing. So I will start out because I, I do attend the legislative meetings with um, Maryland Association of Boards of Ed, and I try to brief you all um, when we have significant things occurring. Um, the, uh, the assembly will, uh, general assembly goes into session January 9th. So the last meeting I did with Mabe, I'll keep it as brief as I can, we voted on the the items that we think are important that were positions that we're taking ahead of the General Assembly. Um, there's only four of them, four key ones. There's a lot of, of legislation that is gonna be enacted under each one of these, but the overall look, what Mabe is trying to endorse is, the first one would be, well, the first thing, we're very happy that question one on the Education Trust Fund did pass um, during the vote in November. And that um, we should see, hopefully, eventually see some additional state funding going to the schools as a result of that vote. Um, uh, we, uh, the, the one of the legis first legislative position that we took overall is to su support continued governance autonomy for the boards of ed. That's always important to us that we have the ability to, to run our own, our own boards, and that's important to us. We don't, it's, it's not good to have the state run our boards or the General Assembly run our boards because they, every board is unique in its own, in its own um, makeup, its own school system. They're unique in like we're, we're half rural and half, you know, Ken Island or, you know, more uh, suburbs. So we have lots of um, different types of boards. So there, we don't, every, one size doesn't fit all when it comes to boards. So MABE always pushes 
to be sure that we still have our autonomy when we're when we're setting our education policy and we're setting our, our, our school budgets. Um, we do oppose unfunded mandates. That's a big one. For the, we have to be careful. We're always pushing the, the assembly not to make mandates for us that they don't send the dollars with it because it just drives us crazy and it, it drives the commissioners crazy also. Um, they're pushing the um, legislative position we voted for is to support full funding for public schools. Um, we're asking for a passage of uh, the Kerwin legislation to update and enhance constitutional adequacy and equity of the state and local funding. And top priority is establishing a per pupil funding allocation for pre-kindergarten students. The third uh, key legislative position we voted on is to support robust state funding for school construction and renovation projects. And the fourth one that we're um, pushing for this year is support for sustained local government investments in education. In other words, the co county commissioners and the county councils of the different counties to um, help us with local government investment. Specifically, we're seeking to update state law to ensure that the local funding increases above maintenance of effort to include the local share for students in four categories in particular. Funding of pre-kindergarten, we've been pushing that for a while, special education, economically disadvantaged students, and English learners. So there's an effort for us to push with our um, county commissioners and our county councils for um, specifically updating laws to ensure we can get local funding over, over MOE for those kinds of things. So that's the, the key things that we talked about in the legislative um, session, my uh, committee I'm on, and I would try to update you as things change over, over the year. So does anyone have any other thing they'd like to add? Um, I would. Okay. Um, this past week I attended the Queen Anne's County High School jazz concert. Or it was the actual winter concert. It was the jazz band, concert band, and symphonic band. They did a wonderful job. Brief interruption and excitement at the end there with a little fire in the catwalk, but otherwise they did a beautiful job. Great. Thank you for going to it. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Um, l lately, I've um, been at some of the swearing-in, so I attended, um, as a representative of the Board of Education, the swearing-in of Catherine Hager, uh, the clerk of court, and um, saw Dr. Kane and um, some of the exec team there. And then last night was the swearing-in for our new slate of commissioners, and there was a nice reception at the Kramer Center afterwards. So um, I'm happy to, to see all them elected and work with them in the ways that we need to work with them. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. O'Connor. Um, we'd like to develop a good, you know, as good a relationship as we can with the county commissioners. I think we, we have similar um, goals, mm -hmm. and we have to just work together to get to them. Mm -hmm. So thank you for representing the board to that. Mm -hmm. So the next item is uh, superintendent involvement. Great. Thank you, Captain Kelly. Once again, I, I know I've said it, but I'm, I'm just happy and I'm going to say it again. I'd just like to congratulate our new board members and congratulations to you as president and to Ms. Harper as vice president of the board. Uh, each of you bring a wealth of experiences and skills and we will be happy to work forward in moving our school district forward and, and using those skills because we need them. Thank you. Um, monitoring visits continue. So we visited or I visited um, with APA leadership or or Anchor Points Academy leadership in Centerville Middle School. Some other monitoring visits occurred. I was not able to attend because of other meetings, um, but those monitoring visits continue. November 28th, I had an opportunity to serve on the Teacher Education Advisory Council, TIAC, for Howard University School of Education. TIAC serves as a coordinating and advisory unit for all teacher education programs at Howard University. They are comprised of various um, departments within the school, PK, that's pre-K to 12 schools um, and we link to different agencies to um, that are committed to teacher education, teacher preparation. Um, School of College, uh, College of Arts and Sciences, uh, University Library Sciences, of course the School of Education, all of them are part of that and I'm happy to join with them and, and it's in my intent to use this partnership as a conduit to help us to increase our workforce diversity efforts and you'll hear more about those efforts later tonight. 
On December 4th, um, my executive team and I attended the swearing-in ceremony, of course, as Ms. O'Connor just mentioned, for the county commissioners. Um, Stephen uh, Hershey, Senator Stephen Hershey, Delegate Steve Arents were there. Board members Morissette and O'Connor were also present, along with a standing room only crowd uh, of former commissioners and supporters. Um, so, and I see Mr. Simmons, yes, is here, and, and he was there as well last night. So it was a great evening to support the, the new commissioners. Um, and this is not so much a, um, a um, report out of an event, but this is just a reminder, since I have the microphone. Um, on yesterday, December 4th, Maryland State Department of Education uh, released the new school report card website. The new report card summarizes school and school system performance with the new Maryland Accountability System. Um, and that's related to Every Student Succeeds, or ESSA, so ACT. So I'm proud to report that Queen Anne's County Public Schools scored consistently well throughout the district. Um, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but in short, the report card is a snapshot of how schools perform. It also um, gives a ranking of each school in comparison to other schools across the state. So we have, and there's a star rating. So the rating goes from one to five stars, and all of our Queen Anne's County Public Schools schools scored or were evaluated between three and five stars. So we have one school with three stars. All the other schools are four or five stars. And I can tell you that we have a couple of schools that are right on the cusp of moving from a four to a five. So across the state, we fare quite well. And I think that the public would be interested as well as you. We're doing a great job. We're continuing to move forward in our academic progress. One thing that I would like to remind our families is that within that star rating, in the event Evaluation. There is a section that um, incorporates um, school climate, uh, student services, and attendance is calculated. So we are getting a score that comp com is comprised of attendance. And the definition for chronically absent has changed. So if a student is enrolled with us for 10 days and they are absent for one day, they are chronically absent. So it's a tenth of their days for enrollment. So that is different and it doesn't matter if students' absences are excused or not excused, it counts as an absence and will count toward being chronically absent. We do have some work to do in this area. Sometimes students are absent because they're sick and they need to be home and I wouldn't ask a parent to send a sick child to school because then we'd have half the school and staff absent. But if we take a closer look at our vacation schedules, I think that that is going to help us to fare a bit better in terms of our rates of chronically absent students. So I'm asking the public, our families, to take a close look at that and to work in cooperation with their schools um, for that. So uh, only 12 of 14 schools were evaluated. Need to let everybody know two of our schools were not evaluated, and that is Kent Island Elementary School and Centerville Elementary School because they did not have enough points to be part of this accountability system. They don't have fifth grade. All of our schools, elementary schools, don't, but the ones who don't, Churchill Elementary School had enough points to where they could still be a part of the accountability system. So, but I want to say everything looks good. Those two schools, those primary schools, won't be a part of the accountability system, so you will not see a star rating for those. Dr. Kane, if I can interrupt you, what are, what are the, how are the points awarded? How does the school earn points? There are about five different categories, and I can read those off to you. I, I don't want to take a whole lot of time for that, and I think I brought all of my documents in here. And I didn't. But there's academic progress. There's um, the climate, school climate, and um, student services. There's, um, there's, there are about five different ones, and I can't rattle them off off of the top of my head. I thought I had brought my documents. I have it right here. Well, actually, I do have them. Academic achievement, graduation rate, progress in achieving English language, language proficiency, readiness for post-secondary success, and school quality and student success. Uh, what were the two schools that didn't have enough points? 
or K, the K to two the, the pre-K to two, two schools. So Centerville Elementary School and Ken Island Elementary School. All of those five indicators are the same for each level. However, they comp they are comprised of different <coughs> components. So they are it's one thing for elementary. There's another for middle, and then there's another for high school. So all of that information um, is available on our website, and information sent out to parents on yesterday, and a press release went out on yesterday. So I just want everybody, it's a pretty big deal, um, and it's new, so I want everybody to be aware <laughs> of it. And if you haven't gotten the letter, please go to our website and call your school because your school does have information. I believe all of them got sent out on yesterday. So that was just one important thing that I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of. Um, and definitely just please check the school websites for, this is winter concert time, please check the website for winter concerts because those are going on right now. And that's all I have for uh, this month, but I, I thank you, Captain Kelly, for inviting our board members to be a part of this time where we report out what we're going to do or what we've already done in terms of community involvement. So thank you. Um, now, involvement by our Deputy Superintendent, Mr. Poliski. Thank you, Madam President. Likewise, to the Superintendent, we'd like to welcome all of our new board members, and we look forward to working with you. Uh, briefly, on uh, November the 8th, I had an opportunity to be part of a state work group on the new, potentially new teacher and principal evaluation. So they're collecting feedback from local jurisdictions as they think about making changes to that. Uh, likewise, ongoing with the superintendent and Ms. Pauls uh, attending our monitoring visits, and we'll be providing, Ms. Pauls and I will be providing an update to you uh, in January with a full report. Uh, on November the 13th, I had an opportunity to represent Dr. Kane to introduce uh, Mr. Chris Heron at the Assembly uh, at, Queen, at uh, Ken Island High School, as well as uh, attend that evening or the other evening uh, the simulcast that took place at Queens County High School. Uh, on November 26th, I had an opportunity to attend the Education as Multicultural Community Meeting. Uh, on November the 29th, I had a great opportunity. The Aspiring Leaders Academy, which is made up of uh, assistant principals that aspire to be principals, their meeting was held right here in the boardroom. And I had an opportunity to uh, do some mock interviews with some potential candidates um, from other counties as part of that. It was a great experience. Um, and likewise, attending with the superintendent as well as some board members uh, last night to welcome our new county commissioners. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Now is our opportunity for community participation. Ms. Harlow. Um, yes, anyone who would like to speak, we will call you up if you've listed your name on our, agenda, on our um, information list. If not, we'll call for people who would like to join us at the end. We ask that all speakers keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three, months, three minutes in length. However, we do allow elected officials and um, organizations five minutes. We ask that you keep comments to three minutes if you are an individual or a community member. Questions or statements to the board that relate to a re should relate to a recent agenda item, an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be discussed at the bargaining table. Please do not discuss, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is not the proper venue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially those matters on a legal appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment, should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through available channels. Citizen participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your messages freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when offering your critique. The first name we have registered is Mr. Warren Wright. Hey, thank you all. I'm Warren Wright. I'm one of the volunteers for the Drug Free Coalition. I came tonight to thank uh, Dr. Kane and our assistant uh, superintendent for allowing us to bring Chris Heron into the school system and speak to all of the high schools. Uh, along the way, I um, can't have, I did need to mention that um, Brad and the uh, uh, 
from st uh, Student Services and Josh Cohn's, um, the principals at both schools, and uh, particularly Assistant Principal Dan Harding at uh, Kent Island High School, really helpful. Um, next week we start, we're going to do the post survey, because as you know, along with QA Goes Purple, we um, are determining if, if the 10 things we want the community to learn, how well they learned them. Um, with that, then uh, we're, by school preference, those two high schools will be choosing activities to do. I know they hit us up for some, for some iPads, so they're doing something. Um, those things will continue, and then uh, we will work uh, towards next year, because as you know, it's a two-year program. All of this, by the way, I send out an emails, and I can certainly send a letter with the, uh, the 21 agencies that helped us with QA Goes Purple and the many business people, uh, the churches. Uh, the sheriff uh, initiated the program along with the county commissioners. We could all have done that by letter, but I wanted, and as they usually do, I wanted to make a point of those people that really do the work once it's approved by the uh, superintendent. And I can't ha leave without mentioning Sid Pender and his crew. Uh, I don't know some of the details, but I do know most of the details, and I know that you don't assemble every kid at each school just by saying there'll be, an, there'll be, an, there'll be a meeting today at 8 o'clock in the auditorium. It doesn't work quite that way because, first of all, they can't all sit there because <laughs> there isn't space. Uh, but before I talk about that, uh, we were going to do Chris Heron in November, but we found out that QA Goes Purple, which is a something that's done all over the eastern shore now they say you're you got to light up your community in september not at the end of november warren which is when you had planned to do it so we got our grant money a little late and so two weeks before school started i came to sit and i said hey sit could you guys light up the two high schools uh, i know school opens in two weeks and you're not probably that busy but could you do that for us and he did no oh, by the way could we um get you to hang, hang some uh, 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 four by four brochures in the, both of the high schools from the ceiling. Um, and he graciously and his crew did all that. Um, when it came time to have Chris Heron, um, we found out that um, it's National Education Week. So the 500 chairs that we borrow from the middle schools so that there's enough seats for all the kids to come and sit in the gymnasium that's not going to happen because the middle school needed all those chairs. Sid worked all that out. We also found out there's no screen at Kent Island High School big enough for that presentation. So we worked that out, and I believe we had a contractor, and we locked, worked with Josh uh, Combs to get that set up and worked flawlessly. Sid did all of that. Um, Queen Anne's County gym didn't have an audio system that would show the movie and also be heard by all of the kids. We had to do that, and we were almost ready, and then we found out that the auditorium at Queen Anne's County High School and Kent Island could not simulcast. Sid took care of all of those things, and it came out uh, without a flaw. Whether or not the impact of Chris, I think, was pretty impactful, but we certainly couldn't beat the organization. He did, certainly did make us all look really good by taking care of all those things, and so I just wanted to say that as publicly as uh, I could. I don't want Sid to get a big head, but um, <laughs> he did a great job for us. We appreciate it greatly. So we saved all those banners. So our goal now is now that we've practiced to come back and really hit all the middle schoolers with a really good program. And I want to thank you all for opening that door so the community could get in there and the kids could hear somebody we think was pretty good. Thank, thank you. you. You bet. Yeah. Our next gentleman registered is Mr. Richard McNeil. Good evening, Richard McNeil, and uh, representing the uh, retired school personnel. Uh, we changed our name as of this year, and, and I'm still getting used to putting it in the right perspective, but we're doing that. On behalf of the retired school personnel, I'd like to welcome all the uh, new, new board members and, and uh, Carrie for coming back and, and joining us and, and Sharon and everybody else. And uh, we look forward to your supporting your programs as much as you support us. And we appreciate that very much so. Um, I'd like to just uh, highlight, I was at the uh, band concert at Queen Anne's High School, which I thought was excellent. Um, I want to commend the band director and the students for their 
behavior for the ending of the program, which was unscheduled, and, and of course, but uh, I thought uh, um, Eric Wright and the band members did an excellent job of handling the situation for what it was. So my stars go off to him mm -hmm. in that situation. I uh, also like to give a, uh, another thanks to uh, Teresa Steinheim in, in HR. Uh, she has been our liaison between the, those of us who were over 65 and the transition into the new health and prescription program. And uh, she has been very helpful um, and keeping us up to date on any additional information that we can share with our members. Uh, we have our meeting on Tuesday of this coming week and uh, I was just uh, talking with her on Monday as whether or not information, new information needs to be shared and so forth. Uh, we are anticipating our new cards at any time uh, they should be here within this week or next week and all that and and again as we hit january uh, we still have some folks who are a little nervous about that but anything new is coming so we appreciate that uh, i also attended our the um, mrspa the state groups uh, legislative update on november the 14th and uh, some of the things that uh, captain kelly shared they shared with us um, uh, where we're going with the budget and the and, uh, the uh, pension program and the um, retirement program. There's still some folks out there who are in the old retirement system, less and less still in the uh, workforce, but uh, and how that's going and, and hopefully it's uh, active. The goal for us is 78% uh, return on the investments and right now we're at 73%. So that's pretty good considering everything going and uh, so um, we all hope that those pensions last forever. Um, one of the things uh, I know it's um, you know the the memorial service for our former president we also there was also a memorial service today for Pat Biddle who was a member of this uh, organization for a number of years um, and a uh, principal at uh, Sellersville Middle School supervisor of math I mean not math music and uh, just a just a good man for our system um, retired in 1986 or 87 somewhere in there passed away this past friday uh, at the age of 94. so i mean he it, it was a good man for and did a lot for the community uh, because he sang in the community and he also did a lot of arts and crafts so his his memorial service was uh, this afternoon so i'd like, just like to kind of shout out for him and uh Again, look forward to the, the board members. Uh, you got a major task coming up with uh, budgetary things coming. Um, it seems like that's a never ending uh, process for the superintendent and her team. And uh, I've been on that end. Uh, I'm glad I'm not on that end anymore. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next registered guest is Mr. Kevin Kintop. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm Kevin Kintop. Um, I am speaking to you tonight. I normally come and speak as a parent whenever I do public speaking, but I'm actually speaking as an employee tonight. Uh, I am the program director for Anchor Points Academy, the alternative program for the school system. Um, I also oversee online learning and distance learning for the county, and I work with our summer school program. And I just want to take an opportunity to welcome our new members. Um, alternative education and online learning is an evolving piece of education nowadays and it's going to become a much bigger part in what our school system does so I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Um, welcome back to those of you that have, were here or were here before and welcome for the first time. Um, I, anytime that I can be of service to share with you what's going on I'd be more than happy to do that and just wanted to say welcome. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Kentop. Thank you. And our next guest is Ms. Karen Fields. Hello everyone, I'm Karen Fields. I'm president of the Queen Anne County Education Association. I wasn't able to attend the last Board of Ed meeting, so I wanted to publicly thank uh, Ms. DiMaggio and Ms. George for their service to the community and to our students. Um, the common ground that we all share is that we want the best for our students. I'd like to welcome back and congratulate um, Ms. Harper and Ms. O'Connor and welcome and congratulate Ms. Morissette and thank uh, Captain Kelly and 
um, Ms. Harlow for their continued work and congratulations on becoming president and vice president. And hello, Dr. Kane. Hello. Um, as Captain Kelly knows, last year our teachers respectfully articulated the needs that we had as far as the budget went to the Board of Education. And I'm glad that you mentioned collaboration because collaboration is a big part of what the association does throughout the year with the Board of Ed and with administrators. For example, um, we revised the teacher observation form last year very successfully over a period of months with um, a team of teachers and a team of administrators. That went very smoothly. We worked with um, Mr. Kintop on testing issues that came up that were part of state legislation. So collaboration is an important part of what we do, even in negotiations because we try to um, disagree without being disagreeable, which is something that we teach our students and it's something that certainly you know, applies to our life, everyday life. I also wanted to invite all the Board of Education members at some time to come to one of our RA meetings. We have them um, once a month, the third Tuesday of each month, and I think it would be great for you to come and talk to um, the representatives of each of our schools to get a first-hand take on the issues that face um, teachers and staff every day. So congratulations, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank, Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And is there anyone else who would like to speak that hasn't signed up? That will conclude our community, sir, uh, community input. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harlow. Thank you to all the, uh, the uh, participants. We appreciate hearing what you have to say. And we'll work on that collaboration, Ms. Fields. Um, okay, presentations. Okay, Dr. thank Kane. you, Dr. Uh, Captain Kelly. We have three presentations tonight. We're going to start with 6.01. There's a teacher and principal evaluation um, update, and Mr. Brown, David Brown, is going to come forward for that presentation. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Madam Superintendent, and members of the executive team. Uh, for the record, my name is David Brown. I am the Supervisor of Accountability for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And tonight I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, teacher and principal evaluations, uh, go over the parts of our comprehensive evaluation and discuss uh, our data from our 17-18 school year. Uh, teachers and principals both receive a comprehensive evaluation each year and the comprehensive evaluation is based on equal parts of the a professional practice piece and on student growth. Uh, they're based on calculations. Uh, teachers and principals are identified as either ineffective, developing, effective, or highly effective. Uh, on the comprehensive evaluation. And then these comprehensive evaluations are reported to MSDE. Uh, for teachers, uh, for non-tenured teachers and teachers who are due for recertification, receive a professional practice evaluation each year. Uh, other tenured teachers who have been evaluated as effective or highly effective in the past two years can carry over their scores for an additional year or two uh, unless they choose to request a new professional practice evaluation from their principal. We use the rating of developing uh, for non-tenured teachers uh, or in rare circumstances tenured teachers who are facing unusual circumstances during that school year that have not shown to be uh, effective. Uh, this rating was once unique to Queen Anne's County. It was not recognized by the state of Maryland, but this past year the state of Maryland is now 
begun to recognize the, the rating of developing. For the professional practice uh, domains, we use the Danielson framework uh, for teaching. So we're actually looking at planning and preparation, instruction and assessment, classroom environment, and professional responsibilities. Hey, for the professional practice for principals, uh, all principals receive a professional practice rating each year. We do use the rating developing for principals uh, who may be new to the role uh, or new to the school system. Uh, the pra professional practice categories were clusters from the leadership framework. We are currently using, or, or during the 17-18 school year, we use professional learning, instruction and assessment, school environment, and vision. And they are not all rated equally. You can see that each of the top three on that table get 15% of the professional practice piece with the vision being worth 5%. Uh, we are going to be switching to new professional practice standards. Uh, Mr. Paluski mentioned that the state is currently working on that. So for the, the, this current school year, there will be new professional practice uh, standards in place. For principals. We also use student growth as part of the comprehensive evaluation. It is an equal part of the professional practice to the professional practice piece. Each teacher develops two student learning objectives. Uh, these should be developed working with the building principal. Whenever possible, we encourage that the, the SLOs be on two different approved measures. And for high school teachers that teach HSA or tested contents, uh, they're required to have at least one of their SLOs linked to that classwork based on the, the assessment or performance, student performance. The student growth piece for principals consists of three student learning objectives, and they are developed working collaboratively with the, the program director of teacher and leadership development as well as the deputy superintendent. Uh, principals are encouraged to make at least two of their SLOs on improving student group performance, uh, which we expect in turn will improve results on both district and state assessments. Kind of a graphic showing how the teacher evaluation is built. You know, the entire comprehensive evaluation, 50% of it is based on the professional practice piece. 50% of it is based on student growth. So we can look at that as each side of that being 12 points. And the, the four domains Danielson, uh, from the Danielson framework being each worth 12.5% or three of the 12 points. Uh, and each of the SLOs being worth six points each uh, creates the whole comprehensive evaluation. So in the end, we start looking at how many points makes a highly developed teacher. So when we calculate everything out, you know, if a teacher has more than 21 points, they are considered highly effective. We have a range from 13 to 21 that, that would be rated as a, an effective teacher. For a tenured teacher, uh, there is no developing at, uh, unless they are, have special circumstances. So anything less than 13 points would make that teacher rated as ineffective. For a non-tenured teacher, we have a range of 10 points to 13 points that would make them developing. Anything less than 10 points, they would be considered ineffective. Mr. Brown, question on that. How, it's going to be complicated. How do you, is it the principal would evaluate student growth or is, how do you guys look at student growth? Student growth, they, the teachers actually create an SLO, a student learning objective, yeah. that can get a little bit complicated, but they're actually looking at a, a measurement of student grow, growing on an assessment or on, on some sort of a measurement that they set forth that usually runs most of the school year or at least a significant amount of time. Uh, and then it is, do the students obtain that? Do they fully attain it? Do they partially attain it? Or, or do they have insufficient attainment? 
So those are the three ratings that a teacher would get on each of those SLOs. If they were fully attained on SLO, they would get six points. If they partially met that, they would get four points. And if they did not meet it enough based on, on their goals, then it would be two points. But again, this is, these are goals that are set up with the teacher and the principal talking it out, setting realistic but hopefully rigorous uh, achievement goals for their students. For each individual student, then, they're looking at something like that? In some cases, it's looking at a group of students performing each individually, so it may be the entire class and each student within the class. Sometimes they may ch choose an individual subgroup, and they may want to improve their farm students or their special needs students' scores. So it could be a large group of students or it could be a very small targeted group. Ideally, with two SLOs, one could cover a large group and one a small group. We also can tier the SLOs. So what one SLO may have three or four parts to it. So they may target a large group of students as part of that. And then as a second part of that same SLO, they may target a specific subgroup. So it can get very complicated. It's, it's a big workload, I would think, getting that set up. Is that all set up before the kids come to school, or is uh, it? Usually by October, the teachers have set up okay. their SLOs and have worked it out with the principals. Mid-year, there should be a review with the, the principal and the, the teacher to see if they're on track and make any adjustments to that SLO as needed. And then early spring, they start evaluating those SLOs and working on the full comprehensive evaluation. Thank you. May I ask, this sounds incredibly subjective. I mean, how, how does a teacher have recourse if they've been, after their tenure, then they get evaluated as ineffective over something that they feel that they've done their, you know, they've done their due diligence? I mean, it, you, I, we you, haven't gotten to that part yet, but is there, a re, is there a recourse for them? Again, this should not be a surprise to any teacher. They should, be, they should know their position Developing over the course of the year. Right, because okay. the, the professional practice piece, it is very subjective because it is actually a, a principal and possibly supervisors coming in and observing their practice within the classroom. Uh, each of those, the teacher is provided notes and suggestions and that throughout that. Assistance, I would, say. I would suggest assistance. And assistance if necessary. Okay. Uh, so the t it's, it's not going to be a surprise come okay. June that, that suddenly they're ineffective. Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, that's more subjective. The student growth piece is a, l a little more objective because the teacher has a big part of choosing what students they're focusing on and what their final goal is. Thank you. The high school stu uh, teachers, though, have, have one semester and then another semester, so they have to create this for both semesters. Most of the high school, and, and I, again, I'm going to look to Mr. Poluski and Dr. Kane on this, but I believe most of the high school SLOs, uh, are, a lot of them are focused on semester one, because then they can get that SLO done, completed with a, a group of students, early enough that, that everything can be scored and evaluated early in the year, so they'll, they'll have a better understanding. Some do go full year courses, and some do go second yeah. semester classes. But again, it, an SLO can be for a, an, a class itself. It doesn't have to be for both semester courses. The principal evaluation is very similar. Uh, again, it is based on professional practice being half of the evaluation, student growth being the other half. Uh, as a, I mentioned earlier, the professional practice piece is not three uh, equal por uh, four equal portions. It is actually divided up so that 15% for three of the categories with vision only being 5%. Uh, and it has three SLOs instead of two SLOs. You mentioned that the standards are new this year versus last year and the principal evaluations, is that correct? The standards for this current school year will be, you know, are being new and they're actually they're being finalized now. Okay, so that's not this. Right. Yeah, we're, we're going to be looking at 17-18 data, not 18-19 okay. data. And can you, t do you, can you summarize quickly what, what change is well, being implemented? Everything you're seeing now will be the same except the professional practice piece for principals. Instead of having uh, those four pieces there, there are actually going to be ten uh, 
indicators that they will be measured on, and at this point, it looks like they will be 10 equal measurements. Wow. Okay. Uh, at least, again, I'm going to look over to Mr. Kaluski on that to make sure that that is still the... the That's correct. There, so they went from really four domains that have indicators into that into 10 specific domains. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, schools are very engaged in the school improvement process. Even though that's not specific here, it now becomes a new indicator in their in the new evaluation system. I'll give you another example. Um, our work around equity. Now that is a standalone indicator, although it's not a standalone indicator here. And what we've decided to do, as many other jurisdictions, is those will be weighted equally uh, across all of those domains. So we'll we can provide more updated information on that. I believe in the spring, um, we had done, a, uh, Ms. Pauls had done a, a brief presentation on support for principals that outlined those 10. I'd be happy to reshare that with you if you want to get more specific. But as we move forward, we'll share with you, you know, going forward what those domains are going to be, especially in the new data that will be performed. So they're all, they'll be evaluated this academic year in 18 and 19 on those new ones. So as Mr. Brown said, this is last year's data. I would be interested, Mr. Paluski, if you would send me mm -hmm. how you evaluate equity. I would be truly interested in that. <laughs> Just send it to me. And yeah. that would be an equal indicator amongst the 10 that would be equally weighted as 10% against the other yeah. nine? So, okay. and I think that was a, a question that asked is, you know, is the evaluation side of this, and that's one thing that Ms. Pauls is working on with principals is the evidence collection of that. So there's a variety of things we would use on the professional practice side to evaluate. So for an example, our monitoring visits that we've been doing, that's one piece of evidence. You know, our walkthroughs that we might do with principals, that would be another piece of evidence evidence, their reflection uh, pieces that they provide, that's another piece of evidence. So that's one of the things that we're working on in their new 10 domains is, so what's evidence look like in each one of those? Mm -hmm. and, and that's an ongoing process that we're doing right now, but I'd be happy to share those, those 10 standards with you, of course. So the, the principal does provide you information, like you wouldn't have any idea of his professional or her professional learning that she's done. They have to provide you, here's what I've done to get my professional. And, so and they do have an opportunity to provide information. Oh, absolutely, you. absolutely. Right now, uh, do you to give you an example? All of our administrators uh, complete quarterly reflections. So those reflections are tied right to those four domains. So each, each quarter, you know, a few weeks uh, or a few months in between, they're providing us their feedback of, I attended this in that particular category as an example. Uh, that's one piece of evidence that we would use. Good Thank question. You. Sure. Um, just quickly before we move on, you mentioned that other jurisdictions are using this, and this is something that would be sort of implemented at the state level or it came from sort of a state level. I'm always curious um, about the jurisdictions around us. Would you say that it's about half of them that are using the new? So, so all of the jurisdictions in Maryland have moved to the professional, those new professional standards, the PSLE oh, yes. standards, professional standards of educational leadership is what they're called, where each jurisdiction makes the, the local determination is the weighting of each one of those oh. standards. So as Mr. Brown had mentioned, you can see clearly right here mm -hmm. that one of those domains vision is weighted differently at 5% mm -hmm. while the others are, are, are at 15. So some jurisdictions are, are phasing in their standards mm -hmm. uh, while other jurisdictions like ourselves are weighting them each equally. Okay. So that's been determined locally that it would be 10%. Um, It'd be over each 10. one is being 5%. Okay. Is that, <laughs> sorry, uh, is that common amongst the jurisdictions around us? Is there sort of a streamline and you're kind of seeing that? Or are you seeing, like, okay, this jurisdiction felt like equity need to be weighted higher, you know, learning from what no, is that's working a, that's in a, other that's an interesting question. I, I have not seen a, a full report. I know Mr. Brown and I talk about this often about, you know, uh, what is each jurisdiction doing, weighting it? Um, and that was one of the first conversations that we had. How are others tackling this? Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit different. I mean, how I think it back to one of Captain Kelly's comments about local jurisdictions having, um, you know, autonomy mm -hmm. in, in what works best for them. Mm -hmm. That's just how we've chose mm -hmm. um, to evaluate our principles. Okay. And, and when this format was developed, it was developed very closely with the administration, the, the system leadership, 
and the principals dividing this up, and it was kind of a joint decision where those weights fell. And I, I think, and again, I can't speak for Mr. Paluski and, and Dr. Kane, I would imagine as we move into this new system, there will be a lot of conversation between school administrators and uh, the executive team, and if things need to be weighted differently, I am sure that will be part of the conversation. Okay, so principals had a chance to weigh in on those 10 domains and wit how that would be weighted, and that's a continual conversation. And, okay, I didn't understand that. Yeah, so this, the this was actually decided at ANS meetings, okay. th this formula that we're currently looking at and using. Thank you. And if you look at the point conversion to a comprehensive score uh, chart for the principals, the weights are, are virtually the same as what they are for teachers. Again, a tenured principal cannot be <coughs> developing unless there are special circumstances. Non-tenured principals uh, or, or principals new to the role, new to the school system, uh, could be considered a developing rating. Okay, one, one last one, I promise. Um, for student growth, will those domains remain three in the new guidelines, in, in the new evaluation? So uh, well, the student growth will continue at, through SLOs, even with the new uh, framework that we're using for, for professional practice. And again, they're very similar to the, the teacher SLOs, except these are developed with the principal and, and the central office to work out goals for the principal's scores. And again, a lot of those are based on improvement of the school, uh, on assessments, uh, and other goals. I'm really done now, thanks. Uh, looking at the, the comprehensive evaluations, uh, this is, again, this is 17, 18 school data. We had less than 1% of our teachers being ineffective, less than a half, or just over a half a percent being developing, uh, and the rest being effective or highly effective uh, in the, the professional practice portion. For the comprehensive evaluation, less than a half a percent were ineffective. And again, the comprehensive evaluation is the final evaluation that gets reported to the state. So less than one half of a percent of our teachers were ineffective. We had approximately 1% of our teachers developing and the rest, you know, very close to, you know, actually over 98% were either effective or highly effective. When we first started looking at SLOs uh, several years ago, there was a concern that, that the student learning objectives would be detrimental to teachers' evaluations that would pull scores down. This is just a chart that, that looks at it. Um, and if we look at the 382 uh, teachers that were effective and their professional practice score, it had a negative effect on four teachers. That means four teachers that were effective on the professional practice piece actually dropped to either developing or ineffective because of the impact of their SLO. 249 teachers had no effect. They did not go up or down based on their SLOs. And 129 teachers went from effective to highly effective uh, because of the SLOs. And if we look at the highly effective, the 127 teachers that were highly effective on their professional practice piece, 21 teachers went from highly effective on professional practice when their, their student learning goals were put in there, they dropped to effective. 106 teachers that were highly effective had no change. And of course, you can't go up from highly effective. So there was no positive impact on those. We had three teachers that were ineffective on the professional practice piece. Uh, I'm sorry, we had five teachers that were ineffective on the professional practice piece. It had a positive effect on all of them. So they moved up either up to developing or effective. And we had three teachers that started out as developing on professional practice. Uh, one, the, the SLOs did not affect, and two, it actually had a positive impact on. So overall, there was a positive impact using the SLOs 
in combination with the professional practice piece. Principles, <clears throat> the SLOs had absolutely no impact on their professional practice ratings. Uh, we had 85% of our principles were effective. When we mix, put in their, their SLOs with it, same 85% were effective. We had 7.1% of our principles that were developing. They stayed developing, and we had 7.1% of our principles that were highly effective, and they stayed highly effective. I like how you do that. I mean, we have 14 schools. So we have <coughs> two that are developing, two that are highly effective, and the bulk are, is that what you're trying to say? Uh, looking at, at numbers of principles there, without doing the math, just doing it on top of my head, so we probably have one head. developing, one highly effective, and the rest were effective. Yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm doing actual numbers. Okay. We have 14 schools. Right. Does that include anchor points? Uh, no, we do not have a principal okay. at anchor points. Okay. Thank you. And I'm trying to think off the top of my head if all 14 principals were evaluated. <laughs> I don't know. Because some years they are not because we may have a principal that leaves. We can't do the math if we were in Montgomery County where there's 200 <laughs> schools. I mean. Yes. I was going to ask about that because if we rotate a principal from high school down to a middle school. <clears throat> if a principal changes mid-year, that is a special circumstance. Okay. So that would be so They developing. may not be evaluated. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. We evaluated all principles last yes, year. Yes, okay. we did. All principles were evaluated, <laughs> correct. The year prior numbers. to that, we had several <laughs> principles that left mid year or switched buildings, left so we did not there. evaluate all 14 principles the prior I year. I missed you, Dave. And that doesn't make them developing. No. Yeah. In that case, uh, we just do not do an evaluation. Right. <clears throat> so, in conclusions, you know. Comprehensive evaluations of teachers, we, we evaluated 517 teachers. Uh, more than 98.5% were either effective or highly effective. Uh, you know, we had less than a half a percent were, were ineffective and less than 1% were developing. Uh, and as I said, the, the SLOs had a much more positive impact on teacher scores than a negative impact. So, so again, good job. Good information. And of course, great things are happening in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. <laughs> Is there any further questions that I can answer for you? Good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. So our next presentation will be uh, led by Mr. Brad Engel. We're going to talk about uh, goal two, um, school safety. Okay. Good evening. And welcome and welcome back. Make sure I get the right one here. So I'm here tonight to talk about student discipline and talk about data and um, our safe schools goal two and to pro provide an overview of the uh, strategic plan and I'll talk about some discipline data and discuss what we're doing to prevent and intervene uh, with discipline issues in our schools and as a school system. Talk about trends and patterns related to student discipline and gain an understanding about how uh, discipline data, how it impacts school climate and vice versa. So the, the goals are there are three goals. 99% of students will avoid committing a physical assault. 98% of elementary, middle, and high school students uh, will adhere to school policies involving tobacco, alcohol, and drugs while in school. And 97% of all suspensions will avoid, excuse me, of all students will avoid committing a discipline infraction that leads to an out of school suspension. Under that tobacco, is that where we throw in the vape? Is that? Yes. Okay. Thank yeah, you. that's, and you know, I, I'm gonna talk about that because that's the hottest topic in student discipline not only in Queen Anne's County, but across the state of Maryland. So we're, I can tell you what we are doing uh, to intervene, certainly. Yeah. Um, but talking about, uh, you know, physical assault, and here's the data uh, for us. We, we did have last year 82 physical assaults, um, if we look at the numbers for 2018. Now, percentage-wise, you, know, you know, we met the benchmark. Obviously, we 
are always concerned whenever there's any kind of fight. And, uh, you know, we do, we can't intervene. There's consequences. And, and we talk about ways to prevent fights where teachers are visible to the students and, and you know, available. And, and, you know, we work on trying to, the best way to stop a fight is for, is for it never to begin in the first place. And, you know, coming up with ways to prevent these things is, you know, working with schools, building relationships. And I think making kids feel respected, you know, included, I think goes a long way as well. Uh, the second goal, 98% of elementary, middle, and high school students will adhere to the school policies involving tobacco, alcohol, and drugs while in school. And uh, last year, we had 69 uh, suspensions uh, for these items, uh, for either or, and uh, so students were either in possession or in use or distributing. So we know it's an issue. I mean, we know we're, we're trying to do things as a school system uh, to address that as well. So to continue with the data. Um, Angle, was yes. Was that high school and middle school combined, the 69 infractions? Well, we did, yes. Okay. That's, that's correct. Okay, um, thank you. Yes. And I can, I can get you a breakdown. It's actually on the MSD okay. website. Um, that's okay. Thank we you. didn't have any elementary infractions. Thank God. So, yes, yeah, so that's a good thing. <laughs> um, so these are 98, uh, as far as safe schools, uh, going on to the next one, 97% of all students will avoid committing a discipline infraction that leads to an out-of-school suspension. Um, you see last year, in 2016-2017, in we had the lowest suspension rate in the state. Um, and in 17-18, that number uh, did increase. Um, a lot of it were due to the, to the substance use issue. And we had a number of those issues and students in possession, et cetera. Um, so we feel like we're you know, working to address that as well. And that, I would say that that accounts for the increase. I think when principals suspend students, our principals, I feel, do a very good job of, of not suspending students and keeping students in school. They feel like that's the best thing for students. Mm -hmm. uh, when we feel like a student needs to be removed from the building, we bring them to Anchor Points Academy for five days or, or 10 days. I know when Dr. Kane came in, she said that, you know, what I want to do is if a school, if a student is, is caught with drugs, we want to get them help. So we provide an intervention at Anchor Points Academy uh, for those students. We feel that's of great benefit. Um, while the students are at Anchor Points Academy, uh, we have a wonderful substance use counselor, Kathy Wright, and she does some great things with those kids, getting them assessed and um, helping them. And we're here to help kids. We, kids need a consequence. They need to know what they can do and what they can't do, but we're here to help kids. That's the bottom line. Mr. Engel. Yes. Since Ms. Kathy Wright started, how many students have been assessed? Uh, since last year? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that exact number off the top of my head, but she has done a lot. Um, I mean, I can get you those numbers specifically. Um, I can say that I would say approximately last year, she started last year, and, and she had a partner last year, Alexandra Wade, that worked with her. I would say, thir I would say about 31 last year. So it's, it's in the low 30s. I don't have that exact number, but I can get that to you. Okay. And this year, probably about uh, 10 or 12 already. And these are kids who are avoiding suspension <coughs> going through these assessments? Well, the, we assess any student that is in violation of our substance use policy. So generally there is, like I said, we try to avoid a suspension, we, but we do remove them from their peers for a period of time and put them in anchor points because um, we feel that's more of a consequence. But they have to get up and go and get instruction and help instead of staying at home. Um, but any student that's found in violation of that, and yes, it, the, yeah, most of the consequences were some kind of removal, you know, from their peers. Yeah, well, but yeah, we mandate that in our policy. Any student that violates the policy gets an assessment. Right, and with the substance abuse policy, they are put out of school. They're not brought to an anchor points. They're caught with a vape. They're out of school. Well, if they're caught with a vape, they're violating the... Right, right. That's what I wanted to clarify. That's a violation of the that tobacco does put them out of school. That's a violation of the right. tobacco policy. Right. So they're not necessarily... They're not serving in school suspension. I they're mean, not necessarily way. suspended, though, if they're caught with a vape. Why is that? Because that's, that's a tobacco violation. to me like everybody violation. has So been, that's, a, that's a state law. No, no. They get a... If, if they're caught in possession of a vape, they receive a civil citation. 
Okay. And that's and because they have violated the law. So every student that um, is in possession of a vape that violates our substance use policy in possession of a vape gets a civil citation. But not a suspension? No, not necessarily, no. How do we make that determination? Well, first of all, we, we don't have automatic consequences for students. You have to look at every case individually. The state guidelines indicate that we do not suspend students for this violation. MSD has guided on this and said that if a student is in possession of a vape, that is a tobacco violation. The state's attorney has said, treat a vape the same as you would a pack of cigarettes. Unless there's something in there that's, you know, illegal. Like, uh, you know, like some kind of CDS or something. But if it's a, if, if it's a vape and tobacco, that's, how they, that's what they've advised us to do. And our own alcohol policy, our own school alcohol policy, or drug policy, or cigarette policy, does not suspend students automatically for a violation of this kind. Yeah, tobacco is different, you know, from, okay, we no, treat tobacco differently. Yes, okay, okay, so you just answered my question. We do not have a policy that automatically suspends a student for having a pack of cigarettes or a vape while on school property. We don't have that. Correct? We do not. We do not. How, we don't and, have. And the state does not recommend it either. That's right. We don't have an automatic, we don't have automatic consequences for anything unless you have a loaded firearm on school grounds. That's the only time. I, I think what, where you're going with this is, yes, we have a student code of conduct yeah. where we have expectations and we have consequences related to okay. infractions. And there are a series of options that administrators can take okay. based on the infraction. So for, you know, an infraction, it could be that they receive a number of days of in-school suspension or they could re lose some, co some uh, privilege or there are a number of options. So it's not automatically you get a 10-day suspension. It's, that's what Mr. Engel is referring yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, that's not brain. Okay, I thought this back we there did are, have a five-day suspension there are in that policy. But, um, so I was under the misconception. But what, what about these little cards that look almost like a credit card? And I think that's a form of a vape. Yeah. My understanding is anyone who's been caught up here at the high school with them has had a five-day suspension. They, well, so principals have done suspensions. But according to our discipline guidelines, they should not be suspended. Again, I'll go back to my question originally. How are we monitoring that and ensuring equity? Or they don't have to to be suspended. There are some options that they have. And what we yeah. did last week or two is we pulled all of the principal, the high school principals or middle school principals involved in that. Yeah, we brought all the principals together to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. So that there is consistency between the schools because what we found is that there was not consistency right. uh, right. in the there consequences yeah. mm -hmm, given. And so we pulled everybody together and we worked on revising the code, the discipline um, consequences so that everybody has a consistent consequence that they use. So what you're hearing is you, you probably did hear that um, because there was some inconsistency, but we pulled the group together and we worked on that uh, consequence. And so from this point on, they will be implying the, applying the same consequences or have the same set of options. And one of them is that, and I don't want to get ahead of you, Mr. Engel, but mm -hmm. one of them is that, yeah, law enforcement is going to be involved. They'll take the, whatever the paraphernalia might be and that there will be um, a citation imposed. It's really interesting because I, you know, in speaking with my advisory groups, both parents and um, students, and students on yesterday, you know, we talk about how we can, you know, reduce the number of fractions. We don't have any, dis you know, illusions that we're going to wipe it out completely. It's not, people do what people do, including children. Um, and this is a tough one. This is a tough one. We even had uh, some of our students suggested that the citation be a lot more than $50. I said, well, we didn't set that. We can't control that. But they thought that that would be uh, a greater deterrent because then parents would be getting behind students if it was greater than $50. Um, but, you know, we're going to do a video campaign and we're going to do some social media campaigns. But that is a tough nut to crack. Um, but we do have concern about our students who actually have a nicotine addiction and the most important thing that we do for those students or any student who's caught with any of that paraphernalia whether they're using it or distributing it or just in possession of it is that we get them some help and so uh, part of the consequence is that they have to participate in a cessation um, you know program and and that's part of what I know mr. 
Engel was going to say before yeah, no, I jumped that's in okay. there. Sorry about that. Well, two, so two things happen if a, if a child is caught with a vape or tobacco is... Cigarette uh, or a cigarette. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, we received uh, $22,000 from the Cigarette Restitution Fund. And so Kathy Wright has developed a program uh, working with students and students will stay after... If students are found to be in violation, they will have to spend some time uh, with this nicotine education program. And we feel that that's, that's going to help as well. And of course, they have the civil citation too. So those are two consequences that we give, give to students um, you know, for this violation. And we are working on um, revising our guidelines. Also, that you know, if it's a problem where it's continual noncompliance, then they may face an out-of-school suspension if they're just not listening and they're continuing to be noncompliant. Um, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I've been a big advocate of, of not suspending students, um, and you know, we're gonna. That's the direction I, you know, prefer. And uh, you know, and I, like I said, when, st but it is an issue. You have to balance it with. The, you know, the, of keeping a safe school, and a safe school to me means that you have these paraphernalia out of the building. It's like Dr. Kane said, it's not an easy uh, task or undertaking. You no, know, I'll share with you, I, I cleared out, I worked with the boosters, and um, before football season started, we cleared out trash all around the school, around the field, and underneath the, uh, you know, the, the bleachers. And I was surprised. I found maybe five cigarette butts, which mm -hmm. in my day used to be zillions, but I found about 15 of those vape containers. So it's, it's just, it's a change, a big change in the kids and the vape, you know, you hope those vapes are just, I'm not, you don't hope, but you hope, know that they're just tobacco. So it, it gave me a whole different picture of the vape thing. You know, I immediately jumped from my experience right to marijuana, you know, but it's tobacco for these kids, and it is extremely strong, but it's like smoking behind the gym a cigarette in the old days. So it is a challenge for us to figure out what the best thing is to, to discipline them on and not to go overboard, but definitely get, make it important it to clear, them because yeah. it's much worse than just tobacco. Than and I know cigarette. we had a state meeting, and all the other districts are struggling with the same issue. Yeah. They're all looking for, you know, the best approach and so we're just doing the best we can one student at a time and one you know one day at a time and uh, Mr. Engel and I have been drafting a communication to the community um, that's going to talk to them about exactly this and the efforts that we're taking um, and the new legislation that talks about the fact that they will law enforcement will be involved and that there is a citation and the amount of the citation and all of that so probably a day out we've been tied up today but we probably could get it out tomorrow <laughs> Um, speaking from Ken Island High School, um, there's definitely been improvement from last year because last year when Jules came out, they were like really popular and in the bathroom when you walked in, you just got a headache because people, you can't really see the smoke that like comes out of it. So um, with I think increased um, SROs and with the um, like staff being there like really close to the bathroom, I think it's really helped like that paid out. So yeah, I think the teacher visibility, improved. staff visibility, that's a really important. Thank you. So when a student is caught with vapes, cigarettes, tobacco products, or even CDSs, is there family involvement? You're taking these kids into cessation classes or counseling. Is the family brought in for that same offer if they found it's a generational issue? We haven't, well, we, you know, dealing with the consequence, we just offer to the student. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's an interesting idea. We, we can certainly, you know, make it available to the families or something available to, to the families. That's, that's, that's a good idea. We generally Getting don't. to the root cause. Yeah. I like that idea. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Um, I just have a quick question. And sure. so the vapes, I'm not too familiar with how, like, when the student is caught with the vape, it, I'm curious as to how quickly it can be determined that it's only tobacco. To me, they all kind of look the same, but the inside contents could be very different. So uh, d how is that easily determined? Uh, well, the, the school administrator is going to have to make that decision. And they are the person, if they believe there's a preponderance of evidence that it is, mm -hmm. then they can, you know, um, you know, make a decision about what they're going to do as a school. Now, with all the vapes being turned over to law enforcement, what that does is now law enforcement has every vape. So they can now determine, 
you know, from there, you know, what is in the vape. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had situations where food products have contained different oils mm -hmm. that are, you know, CDS. Mm -hmm. So, you know, somebody brings in some Rice Krispie treats, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. it's scary. It's mm -hmm. very scary. And it takes a you know. while to get that result back mm -hmm. if we sent it out for testing. Yeah, we, yeah, we sent How it out. How long does it take? It can take months. Oh, really? Versus law enforcement now, which will have those results more quickly? Possibly. I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I, all I know is I've been told that it takes months when mm. we turn the information over. Now, they, they would make a decision based on their best judgment whether they feel that there's been some kind of violation. And we can, too. I mean, if we, if, you know, if a, if a student is, is, let's say, smoking marijuana and we can smell the odor of marijuana, we know. We know. That's what I'm curious about because so many of the vapes, even if it's cannabis or um, you know, THC or CBD, it's odorless. And so that, to me, I'm just curious how this is being determined exactly what it is so quickly. You look at the behavior of the student. Mm -hmm. That's true, Sometimes too. Sometimes you can right. do that. You just, you know, there's a lot of things that administrators can do. They can look at the student behavior. Um, we can conduct a search and see what we can find, you know, with the search. And, um, you know, so... You know, like I said, that the administrator has to have that preponderance of evidence. It's different than law enforcement. Law enforcement is, is a little more. They need a little more evidence, but we can take action. Mm -hmm. And again, what we try to do is help the child. Mm -hmm. Bring the parent into the school and say, look, this is what we think is going on. Mm -hmm. Let's work together and get some help. We're not, I'm, you know, I don't think we need to play a gotcha game, mm -hmm. you know. We need to monitor kids and make sure they're not doing, you know, doing the things that, you know, we're talking about intervention and rehabilitation yeah, but if, we, yeah. if, if there's a kid that's under the influence and it's clear we got to pull that kid in we got to bring the parents in we got to bring law enforcement in and then we got to provide some mental health services and counseling this kid needs help mm -hmm. you know it's not trying to you know drop the hammer on this kid we need to really help this child mm -hmm. that's probably um, e easily determined if the THC level was really high but there's so many that have sort of a low THC so you know the, the lack of physical manifestation of the, the cannabis in the system. So that, that's curious to me. And then the last question I have is you mentioned sometimes you're having to send items off and you get those results back months later. I'm not, you know, we're not involved in that. Oh. Um, but because if we... Oh, if we you had to. to. So it's SRO. not like a regular I'm thing sorry, that's we happening. we turned over the SRO and that's, that's all of a sudden that's a law enforcement issue. Uh -huh. And then the, they are, you know, the family's dealing with law enforcement. We're not involved in that. How often is that happening? Where uh, something's being turned over to the SRO uh, is this uh, is a, not, a weekly not or often. No, we don't, monthly? Not that often. We, okay. not, we had a couple incidents last year. Like I said, we've had some food products that we've turned mm -hmm. over to law enforcement. Sadly, as Brad said, it, it takes several months to get the results back by the for food, mm -hmm. and also a lot of times it's harder to test the equipment that is used. It's harder to t detect and test on those food. Um, substances so it's mm -hmm. it's a little bit more complex so only a couple times a year this isn't happening uh, i can only weekly. think of a couple of occasions that we, we did it in the past year and again out of the hands of the board of education yeah, right. that's correct. totally with the law that's right mm -hmm. okay. that's right thank you okay uh and then you can see the you know the the different categories and i i, I know i've gone well over time so uh for last year, the, the reasons for uh, suspensions, and there's the demographic breakdown, um, and this is for another day, but we'll be talking about, I think next month, we talk, or in January, we're talking about disproportionality and, uh, you know, make, and, 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 and the suspension rate. So you can see that there's some disproportionate numbers there. Is that a whole other presentation with ideas of well, ways been, to intervene or in yeah, in January, so one of my roles is I oversee education as more <coughs> cultural, cultural proficiency, along with disproportionality, which talks about, you know, suspensions of African-American students and special ed students. And yes, that's another, that'll be part of what I talk about next month. Okay. I, can, I can get more detail into, uh, into that. And if you, and I would just offer, if there are specific questions that yeah. you want to be sure that we answer in that presentation, if you get them to us, we'll make sure that they're included. Sure. sure. And I already mentioned a lot of things that we do. I mean, there's a lot of, I think getting mental health, mental health and help for these students is really key. That's really, really important. So we've got a good team of student services. They're working hard, creating a school climate where kids feel accepted and respected. We want kids to feel like they belong when they walk in the building. That goes a long way. 
if you do that, you know, you, you've gone a long way to helping kids. What you just said actually was the one thing I took out of the Chris Heron presentation was that, you know, having that feeling of connection as um, a big way that, you know, turning to drugs and alcohol uh, <coughs> is, is not happening. You know, it's just some kind of sense of connection and that's something that he tries to promote. So what you just said absolutely touches on that. Yeah, you gotta feel connected. You gotta feel loved, you know, I mean, you <laughs> <Right>. do. <laughs> that's just life, that's right, the way it is. Right. <laughs> we all wanna belong, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Right, Ingle. Thank you. I, I, one more. I'm sorry. One Close more thing. Right. Oh, one more Mr. question. Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, okay. I noticed in the Bay Times today that um, you, there's an article in there of you, and you've combined uh, some of the committees. Yes. I just wanted to, I, I was trying to figure out, we have not deleted the anti-bullying. The whole committee has been combined into oh, something. Oh, never, else. never. So the anti-bullying no. event that we have every year still is is going to be done. Is that right? I couldn't tell in the article. So the safety net right, safety combines net. the anti-bullying committee, the suicide prevention, and mental health. And we all meet in one big group, and it's a really great meeting. And it's, there's about 40 people there from all the agencies and community members and parents. Then we break up into subcommittees. And we are doing anti-bullying initiatives, and there's a lot of things that, you know, that we're doing. Um, and, and along and in all these areas, but the safety net is that you know, combination. Okay, and thanks. I can provide more information about that too. Be happy to. Thank you. Whatever you need. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Eagle. All right, thank you. Thank you. And our final presentation is um, going to be uh, conducted by Mr. Farley, Mark Farley. He's going to talk about highly qualified workforce um, and include some information about our work with uh, building a diverse workforce. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to be here on uh, the first night for some of you and first night back. It's a joy to work for the Queen Anne's County Public Schools and as a part of the executive team for Dr. Kane. Um, let me get in here. In this presentation, um, we hope to provide you with a snapshot of our workforce and share some of the outcomes uh, of our workforce efforts and some of our new directions and vision uh, related to this goal with the school board members and with the community. First, let me give you a snapshot of our workforce. You know that we have about 7,500 um, students and we have 1,510 employees of all kinds. Uh, that serve our students in such a fantastic way every day. We sometimes forget about our hourly employees, but they represent uh, a fairly significant percentage of our overall workforce at 38%. Uh, there are 566 hourly employees that include substitute teachers and five-hour paras, uh, et cetera. Uh, we have 608 teachers. 35 of which are new this year. Uh, we have uh, 34 administrators, which represents 2% of our total workforce. And we have 302 support employees, which represent 20% of our workforce. Uh, the support administrators and teachers are all collectively bargained among five units, as I've mentioned, and the hourly employees are not. Oh. Is that better? No, worse. You want to do the slide? Slide show. Yeah. Up, at the, up at the top in the uh, red bar, up at the top, can you? There you go. Thank you, Mr. Fister. Click on that right down there. <coughs> Got it. Thank you. you. Sorry. That's better. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so uh, the statistics we provided to the Maryland State Department of Education as of October 11th, 2018, <coughs> reflect that our overall workforce, which is the 1,510 employees that I just outlined for you, is made up of 78% uh, female and 22% male employees. Of those, 7.11% are African-American female and 5% are African-American male. 
and 1.3 percent of the total workforce of 1,510 is Hispanic or Latino and 0.05 percent Asian. Among our 622, uh, excuse me, 566 hourly employees, 11.20 percent are African American and 0.02 percent are Hispanic or Latino. So that's just a little snapshot of the diversity of our current uh, workforce. Um, do, do you I want just me to go back? Add just one little small comment. So in that seven percent Af African American, five percent are African American male. A great majority of those fall in our support three group. Many are custodians. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Our first uh, goal is to retain new teachers at least three years. Uh, and the three-year mark is a real high turnover mark for teachers, whether they're going to like it or not like it. Uh, and our performance in this regard has gone up and down over the years, um, as, especially as the labor market tightens and everyone is trying to get teachers. They tend to follow the money more. Uh, so it's just a matter of crossing the bridge. So our, our 2018 performance, which is um, the 17-18 year, we achieved 74% retention of our new teachers, did not meet the 80% goal. Our next goal was to retain teachers, new hired teachers, for five years. And we really took a fall here. We monitor exit, report, exit interviews. Um, and retaining people is just as important as hiring new people who are diverse because uh, it means the variety of our workforce and the employees we put before our students and can they see their own likeness in them. It actually makes a really big difference. We also are uh, after a 100% standard professional certificate for all of our new employees uh, within three years, which we get um, completely every year because you really have to have your SPC after two years. But we still have 12 um, uh, provisional certificates in tough subjects like Spanish, science, math, et cetera. We have to get, sometimes we have to get people because they're the only people we can get. And then we train them up and help them uh, ensure they meet the requirements for certification uh, within this period. Um, this is a graph of our goal that we hire 10 percent um, minority candidates each year and you can see that it's fluctuated pretty wildly with 2015 being a year where none were hired. And I'll talk in a minute about the things we've discussed that will help us achieve greater results in that area. These are, this is our applicant pool and I share this with you because the the process of, of recruiting is reflected in the applicant pool and their diversity. The more, the more diversity we have in our applicant pool, the more diversity we hopefully will have in our new employee pool, and on and on. So our, um, our applicant pool was about 62% female and 24% male, which is not terribly unlike the results that I shared with you a moment ago and one person who had a non-binary gender, meaning that they didn't identify with either gender. 70% uh, were Caucasian, 7.7% African American, 4.6% Hispanic or Latino, 0.6% um, Asian or Pacific Islander, and 1.2% uh, two or more races, and um, 0.2% African or American Indian or uh, Alaskan Native. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission says people can say whatever they think they are or whatever they identify with. So uh, this may differ a little bit from what it is we have on our records. So uh, in our new, uh, our new workforce quality targets, uh, there are four of them. The first is recruitment to advertise administration positions uh, and teacher positions in more diversity focused publications uh, like Education Diversity, which is an online uh, advertisement for teaching and uh, administration, 
to recruit highly d diverse locations. So we're talking about Bowie State, other historically black or, um, or Latino Hispanic institutions. So that means we have to go further away and we have to, um, we have, to have materials that appeal to people that aren't, um, that aren't like terribly mainstream. They, they want to see themselves just as our students want to see themselves and their teachers. Um, and that we would implement a voluntary affirmative action plan, uh, which means simply that we have to have a lot of labor market information. We don't just advertise and recruit from Eastern Shore. We have to go all over. So our, our labor market statistics and information has to come from where our applicants come from, which is far broader. Um, so these things, this is the first of strategies that we're gathering benchmark data on so that next year we can report how we're doing against this year. Training, we have, uh, we have required that 100% of our employees experience professional development on cultural competency. Um, really all credit to Mr. Paluski and Dr. Kane and, and uh, Ms. Pauls who brought in experts on uh, helping all of our administrators and especially understand the nuances of cultural competency. And, and we've required them also to um, take training in interviewing uh, for that same reason and to avoid legal liability. Uh, the third target is to get a baseline measure on the number of diverse teachers and administrators who are using our tuition reimbursement program to grow and move up into our administration roles, assistant principal to principal, teacher to assistant principal, teacher to uh, specialist, whatever those are. Our goal is to grow people and to place a particular emphasis on opportunities for people, especially if they're underrepresented. And then finally, this is workforce training for all. We talked about this. This is our cultural metric uh, to train 100% of our employees on bullying and harassment. We've seen the devastation that it causes. 100% uh, of our students on Title, title IX, uh, which we have underway. Uh, Mr. Engel is my partner in Title IX compliance. And oops, a little too far there. And then um, to apply discipline uh, for students and employees in a fair and equitable way that's predictable and, and, uh, and equitable. So with that, I would like to ask you, uh, board members, if you have any questions. You said you were doing exit surveys. We um, do exit it surveys. It would be yes. interesting to get a readout of what those. And be happy to do that. Un unfortunately, I don't know that they're entirely reliable uh, because not everyone wants to be completely forthright right. uh, if they're doing their out processing before they've got their evaluation in hand. Um, and so an anonymous system would probably be better. So uh, we have to talk about that. Okay. And also, what ratio of our exiting staff opts out altogether? Well, we do it, uh, we do it face to face. So but they can opt out. They, they can and they do. And that's what I'm asking. Yeah what those numbers are. But we do it as part of their uh, benefits exit, so they have to uh, let us know what their choices are under COBRA or things like that. So we try to leverage that and get the, to get the exit data. And what some districts do is they do it online. Um, so you can do it online or you can do it by a call in. So we're going to be looking at other ways because people sometimes don't, they do want to be anonymous and they might not, you know. They think that uh, there may be some retaliation as they move forward, and so that's a, there's a good reason why we would have high numbers of folks opting out. So we've got to change our process for how we gather that information. Thank you, Dr. King. Thank you. Board members, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Mr. Farley. Thank you, Mr. Farley. Okay, we're going to take a 10-minute break. So we'll come back in 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Um, next item on the agenda is the expenditure report. Mr. Fister. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Captain Kelly, members of the board. Um, before you is the um, 
monthly expenditure report, both in summary form and in detail form. Uh, it's for information only at this point, so we're going to answer, answer some questions at the end. But I wanted to give a brief overview um, because we do have some new board members uh, as to what these two reports mean. They both are identical reports, one more in a summary fashion, one more in a little bit more detail. What this shows us, uh, if you look at the summary, uh, about 15 lines on there, we have the state categories which we are mandated by state law in Comar to have and report our expenditures by these particular categories. They are admin, mid-level, instructional salaries and wages, textbooks, other instructional costs, special education, student personnel services, student health, student transportation, operations, maintenance, and fixed charges. There are some other ones that just don't pertain to us. Um, and then just going across, that's our budget. And this is what we spent in the last period because these reports are always as of the, the first day of the month of the prior month, so, or the last day of the month of the prior month, I'm sorry. So this would be as of 1130, and those would be the expenditures for the month of November. Uh, Encumbrance is outstanding, which includes uh, a salary projection. Uh, therefore, that to and then the year-to-date expenditures, and then the available balance, and then a, just a simple percentage of how much of the budget has been spent. And if you do some reverse math, you'll see 84.85% of the budget has been spent, which leaves 15.15% unspent. This does not include, of course, expenditures that are not encumbered, things such as utility costs, our substitutes, uh, some of our other hourly workers. So you will see that percentage as you go throughout the year to go further down, uh, of course, spending more of our budget. The second report, which I call in your, in your board docs the detail report, is the identical numbers other than each of those categories are broken down between salaries and wages, contracted services, supplies and materials, other charges, and basically that's the catch-all that doesn't fit anywhere else, furniture and equipment, and transfers, and transfers is a special category that we have to um, allocate expenditures based um, on the need, which is basically if we have to pay another LAA or a non-public agency to educate some of our children, it's considered a, a, a transfer. Um, reviewing this, um, expenditures look to be in line. We're actually in a little bit better shape than even last year uh, at this time based on the percentage. Um, there are uh, some small negatives there that we will adjust probably in January or February via a categorical transfer if need be or at least certainly an object transfer once we have to get through the budget pro or into the budget process and have meetings with staff to determine what some of those are. But there are no surprises here. There's no real issues. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We just want to pass the new, <coughs> new people. This is very complicated to understand. Um, it's not in quite as much detail. Um, like you can't look in there and say, oh, where is a bus? <coughs> they, you can go to transportation and know somewhere in there the buses go. So, so to dig deeper, you need to you know, contact Mr. Fister. And Absolutely. as we develop our budget, We'll start to understand more how this works um, because we'll be looking at the nitty gritty on our budget. Yes. Um, so this is like the, the nitty gritty is you're exactly right is the exact thing that we're purchasing. I'll use that as a bus. Well, bus is a bad, uh, yes, not a bad example. Sorry. Let me go into the schoolhouse. So if we're buying textbooks, that goes into the supply and materials category within the instructional supply category. So if you notice on some of the, on the detail in category three, the only thing that's shown there is instructional salaries and wages. It's the only thing that can possibly be reported there. Textbooks, which is in supplies and materials, is the only thing that can be reported in category four. And in category five, again, like I mentioned, that's kind of like everything else, which is like <coughs> meetings and conferences or reimbursements for travel or dues and subscriptions and things like that. Those categories in instruction, only certain things can be charge to those, but if you get into operations and maintenance, you'll see salaries, contracted, supplies, equipment, all of that in one category. So there's a little more flexibility there to do some things, but it's all very similar, and that, as Captain Kelly mentioned, as we get into the budget discussions, we can break these things out a little bit further for you. We can also have some uh, more detailed conversation when we do your orientation. Absolutely. So you'll have some face-to-face -face time with Mr. Fister. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank Fister. you. Thank you. 
So moving to current action items, um, do I have a motion to approve the HR report, which was submitted and brought up at a closed session? So moved. <coughs> Yes. Yes. Okay, the HR report is approved. Next item is a vehicle purchase. Mr. Pender. Point of order, um, Captain Kelly, I thought we had moved policies for second read. That's the that's nine point oh three. Okay, so that's actually it comes after current. vehicle. We've already done that. We moved that. Yeah, it comes we, after vehicle purchase. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Discuss the vehicle. Okay, thank you. Captain Kelly, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll speak on, oh, sure. on, on, on this item. So before you is a request to approve a purchase of a 2019 Ford Explorer to replace Mr. Pender's failing uh, vehicle of hey, over 10 years old. Um, I heard it blew up. It did. It did. With this being a, a material purchase over $25,000, it does require your approval. Uh, it is for a 2019 Ford Explorer XLT four-wheel drive to keep him safe in the winter weather that's coming up here shortly. We did go out. We were able to locate an intergovernmental cooperative purchasing agreement through Howard County government um, where we were able to procure a Ford Explorer vehicle. There's not many bids out there that would allow that. In time of the essence, we needed to piggyback on an existing vehicle. Uh, procurement bid and again like I said that was through Howard County um, the reason we were selecting the Ford vehicle is a lot of our uh, equipment and Mr. Pinder can talk to this is serviced and repaired by our roads board and they have highly qualified mechanics so if we were to go with another brand or whatever we may not get the service and the turnaround as we did so that was the reason we, we were specifically uh, requesting a Ford Explorer so with that I ask that you approve this purchase okay. on behalf of the superintendent so they were purchasing a number of items in Howard County, and we were able to put ours in with their order? You, you, no, no, not a, piggyback on their contract pricing. So are we purchasing or leasing? We are purchasing through capital. Okay. Through the vehicle that was, through the vehicle funds that You'll were see, established. The, the board of, um, and the county commissioners gave us $155,000 to replace vehicles. Most of our vehicles, I think I was, I was telling um, Sharon earlier, out of 18 vehicles, um, 11 of them are 14 years or older. Um, specifically, seven of them are 18 to 21 years. So we drive them until the wheels we fall can't off. get any farther. <laughs> and the um, sheriff's department didn't have one for you to pick up? <laughs> well, like that Buick? <laughs> if they would have given me the Explorer, you know, police yeah. pursuit one. With the police interceptor <laughs> package, absolutely. So I, I do have a question, Mr. Booth. Do we require three bids or can we go just because we piggybacked? Because we, we can. No, because we, we piggyback, yes. we're good. We, okay. We I, I will when the opportunity back. presents us to, for us, but to, in the interest of having um, limited staff and, time, and especially this one being more of an emergency purchase, we do go out and look for existing cooperative agreements that we can piggyback on. Um, saves a lot of time, energy, um, and the prices are every bit as good, if not better, from the larger agencies that we can piggyback on than what we would able to be do here locally. Okay. Can we just try to keep it consistent with public works. Most of the sheriff's departments have explorers. And what I'm working on, it's just more yeah. convenient for those guys to do it. They do a nice job out there. The ones that are really hurting it, um, now are we, we're budgeting we to have potentially those have yes. to per have replace those, in, those? Yes. So basically, not to jump to the gun here, but we have a box truck, Mr. Jeff Risley's, we need to replace. We also have a, um, I'm sorry, a box truck that we transport furniture and all around. Um, that was 21 years old. It just went up. Um, and then Jeff Risley has a uh, maintenance van. It's about 20 years old. So normally when we buy the new equipment, we take the older ones and we use it to kind of move supplies around while they last um, and kind of joke around about Barney Rubble and Fred Flintstone with the feet coming out of the floor. That's kind of literally how we end up with our vehicle. So they are well traveled, I'd say. So that is part of our capital budget. Yes, it was $155,000. Period, on yeah. replacement. Okay. Will we be able to replace all these vehicles within that budget? I'd say we probably get four out of them. Uh, the box truck with a lift gate is going to cost more, obviously, but we can probably get four out of that, um, which is a start. Years ago, 
before we had the, uh, they cut us the 4.5 million, there was a line item that you could replace and that was taken out. So the only way that we got it was through capital, which is, you know, we'll take what we could take, so. Okay, any more questions? So we need to have a motion to approve the purchase of the vehicle as just presented. So moved. Seconded. Okay, we have a motion and a second to replace the vehicle as presented. Ms. Wright. Board members, please call when I call your name. Ms. Carlo? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Mercet? Yes. Ms. O'Connor? Yes. Okay, free to purchase the vehicle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the explanation. Next item is 9.03, policies for second read. Uh, this poli one policy under policy development. Is that Mr. Farley? Yes, we'd like to uh, move that to, to uh, a second read. Uh, we did get some additional feedback from the policy committee, um, so we'd like to address those concerns and uh, have it ready for you on the next board meeting. Okay. Um, anyone have any questions for Mr. Farley? Ms. Harlow, could you talk about the development of that? Um, um, as I said earlier, we had a very productive committee meeting. We have had our first round of edits and improvements on this policy as it was posted for its first read. Pretty extensive, it's a lot of work, and this is a two-page document. When we get to our 15 and 16-page policies, it's gonna be very extensive. But the staff has jumped in, They've been a part of the process that we've developed on how to do these changes. They're all, um, a couple of them were here today. Actually, Betsy's gone now. But they are on board to work hard to use the resources that we have that won't mean we have to buy anything else to do this. Mr. Farley's our lead. Um, we have a community member who's joined our team. And Ms. O'Connor and I are the board members on this team. And we look forward to getting our policies to the point where they're streamlined and pretty cut and dry. And we only really have to get them over to legal for approval on a legal standpoint, get them to the superintendent for her input and approval, because we don't have to waste time with formatting and editing a lot of things after the fact. It's to be done in advance, which we hope will cut down on some of the comments that we do get. Um, and we also have decided that we as board members will get a copy of all of the comments as they're made on each policy per each read. Um, so we're aware where some of these changes might have come from and whether or not they are acceptable changes or not. You could get a comment that's just so out there that it doesn't even need um, much thought that it's not going to work. But then you get some very good, sound comments from our community. And um, Dr. Kane's final authority, Darren's our legal authority, and um, any, any board members, when you see these policies on our agenda, um, hopefully you will have already gone to the website where they're on the page for discussion and for comment out for first read out for second read and you've been able to purview them preview them and follow the changes as they've developed so you kind of saw the first and the middle and the end and then we feel confident that we can pass them you have anything okay yeah so just to, to um, as a reminder the comments or the revisions that we're speaking of with regard to the policy development policy is uh, or are all format. We, you know, established a couple of months ago that these are not concerns with regard to the substantive content of the policies. None of them have been. All of that is format. So we're working through that. But I do want to uh, raise just one concern is that, remember, we don't just have the policies that are coming forward. We've got some policies that have already been approved and some old policies. So we've got a lot of policy work. And that work really is going to require a person to manage that. 
that. And when I say manage that, I mean to uh, do the typing and the formatting. So it's not something Betsy has a full-time job, as does everybody who's involved with that, but that is a lot of sitting down, tedious work. So we are going to be looking to stipend. We're not going to ask for a new position, clearly, but we are going to look for uh, the ability to stipend a person to sit down and just push those because, remember, we haven't approved policies since September. So we've got a number of policies on backlog, not because of substantive issues, but because of formatting. So we're going to need somebody to get through all of that typing work is really what it is that has some understanding experience with policies so that we can get that done. Um, do we need to pay them $30 an hour? No, we don't, but we do need to have someone who can uh, work with us so that we can get that done on a stipend. Will you be putting that out through HR? That, yeah, that position? yes, we will. Okay. But we certainly want to talk about it here openly okay. first. Okay. That goes a little against what we discussed. I'll have to check our minutes. As you know, we prepared minutes on what we agreed, yeah. and we agreed on the modified uh, flow chart for how policies would be done. But the truth is that with what we originally had, 267 policies in all kinds of formats and crinkly paper and stuff, we, in order to get these up to speed and meet Dr. Kane's expectations and yours, we will need some additional help. And I mentioned that. Yeah. in our meeting that I could foresee that um, being um, a money item but it's so necessary but then a lot of input was that they thought they well, could do I, it. I have to commend Joyce Jones for her volunteerism for for the hours she spent but it's not reasonable to expect she oh, no. to continue no. to do that. That's why we want to get this first one as a guide. Uh, yes. And it doesn't, it's not set in stone. You know, a 15 page, po page policy is going to be a whole lot different ballgame than a two page policy. But this is our precedent policy. So getting it done and finished and finally being able to approve a policy since September. So, Sharon, give us a time frame then. When do you think we should be able to have someone come in to do this? Oh, I don't know about we'll, that. We'll take care of that. We'll, we'll okay. put it out there. I don't know there. about that. Yeah. Um, and, and as Dr. Kane said, we will get a lot of these old policies that don't really qualify as being policies anymore. And more like regulations. We'll get them off our list. We'll be approving the dismantling or, or moving aside and putting them where they do belong. Here's That's a question. That's going to help a, a tremendous amount we, of this backlog. Do we need to make a, a board vote on that, the ones that need to be taken we will. out? We will. We, get a chart. we get a chart. Even though they, we know that they're not they policies. Are. Mm -hmm. So we will have to we'll vote on all we'll that. But you might have questions as and to why certain ones are on that list. To facilitate time, can we vote on them as a lump? We do. We do. We do. We do. Okay. I'm, I'm yeah. just asking because I haven't been yeah. keeping up on this. Yeah. Okay. Thank it's you. Called, what is the chart called, Mr. Farley? Uh, it's a workflow. Policy rescission. A flow, a flow chart, chart of okay, policy development. Thank you. Development. Yeah. The policy rescission chart. That. And it's got all of them. So you can go to the number and click right on it on your web, I mean, okay. on your um, board docs. Open it up. There might not even be anything written in it. It's got a title. Yeah. It might have a page number. <laughs> and it might have happened in 1991. Or 93. It's yeah. a big yeah. <laughs> yeah. bundle of those. So the more of those we can get out of the way, out of the, way the better off we are. Fantastic. Yes. They'll all come before the board. Yeah. Okay. I have one question. On the, um, this particular one is under an old situation. So. After the second read, we're putting it out for second read, will we be voting to approve it on the next board meeting? Correct. Yes. And that is what this policy, as I read it, is the change we're going to make. Mm -hmm. Right. Two so reads, and general. the very next board meeting, we vote on Final. it. Final. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. It gives more time for public comment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and just as a side note, um, for our new um, board members, exec team will be including those policies that are going to be coming before you a few weeks in advance in our weekly report so that you can start to take a look right. at it um, a few weeks in advance before yes. we have conversation about it. I'll see. say this sometime. Oh, and I also would like to add that there was some discussion in the committee meeting that we might um, start doing most of our policy work as a board in work sessions because that's what we are. I agree. And, um, you know, we'll hopefully um, have a better record of keeping our work sessions on schedule this year 
and um, that our working members have plenty of notification that they need to be off those mornings because it is a morning meeting 11 to 2. We don't want to blindside you guys, but we have that work session scheduled just every third Wednesday of the month. It'll vary once in a while depending on need, but that's that in the manual. That's a, that's a guideline, and that's when we need to do, be doing our board policy work is at these work sessions. But just for clarification too, we only need three of us to be there to have a quorum. So if, if again, you, you guys have gonna, daytime yeah. jobs that- We're gonna talk about <coughs> that, I think, at the <coughs> next work session. Okay. Because the, the timing, we can alter that. And I okay. need to work with the superintendent. Um, because I would like to be flexible. And we won't the, vote at the work session. Gotcha. But we'll discuss. So if somebody can't be there, then you'll have had the policy a couple of weeks in advance, and you'll be able to add whatever input, whatever comment you want to, whether you can be there or not, because you'll have had the policy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We so at the are we talking meeting. about people not attending work sessions? Not no, I'm no, 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 no. Okay. No. I just um, need to clarify. Just in case. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we may, we may want to talk it's on the 19th it about just the not having. Yeah, we might sure. talk about yeah. the timing, and yeah. we need to work with yeah. people that don't have the flexibility right. to work timing. Exactly. Right. Okay. Um, so on that, we we don't we need a motion to move this to the second read. To move the policy uh, development policy number 110. So I need a motion to move that on for a second read. I move we move policy 110 to a second read. Posted on the website for review and community comment. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to take policy development number 110, move it to a second read, and post it on the website for public comment. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Forsett? Yes. Ms. O'Connor? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, next item, if we have anyone out there who wants to make another, um, it's an opportunity for citizen public comment. Is there anybody out there? I think we're clear. Thank you so much. And I think we'll run through our, you want to run through our meetings? I'm you going to do that right Oh, now. okay. Yeah. Okay. So future meetings and events. Um, on the 19th is the school board budget work session. Um, actually, it's a work session including this policy information. The other item, speaking of that, is in the past when we start the budget process, we have um, each board members have thought about what they consider priorities when we're at the early steps of creating the budget. We try to give them our priorities um, and talk about it a little bit so the superintendent has an, op uh, an idea of what may be important to us. So this is a chance for us, so I'd like you, everyone, to please think about what your priorities are when it comes to creating a budget for the next year, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that on the 19th. Is that 11 to 2? Right now it's 11 to, yeah, it is 11 to 2. That will not change, okay. um, and I'll, we'll get um, an agenda out for that meeting. One of them I did want was your ideas on what you consider important. In the past we've had... Um, small class size, for example, small class sizes is important to you. Um, s compensation for the staff and te for the staff. Those are a couple of key things we've used as priorities. We've also had um, we had a survey done by the public as what they think is important with budget priorities. So be thinking about what those things are. Be thinking about what's important to you and what you've heard from the people out in the field, the constituents, and uh, we'll spend some time talking about that and giving a, a little bit of guidance to the superintendent because she's in the early phases right now mm -hmm. of starting the budget process. And when will our budget survey be posted? Sorry to jump in. Mr. Fister, what are our dates? I, I, I have some final work to work with our communication specialist, so I'm hoping within a few days. It's a little bit oh. further behind than well, what well, I had anticipated, close. but okay, good. it's right That's around great to the hear. time. It's still okay. time, timely. Yes. Yeah. Right. Great. And, and we will keep that open through the holiday into the first part of January. Great. So there should be plenty of time to respond. Uh, January 9th is the next board meeting. We don't want to have it the day after um, New Year's um, so the staff can enjoy their holiday too. January 16th is a budget work session. January 30th is another budget work session. We, we are free front load for the new members. You front load these work sessions when we're dealing with the budget process. But if you look um, 
on the um, the overall picture of our budget I mean, of our meetings for the rest of the year we do gradually move back to just two meetings a month but the well, budget is the bi biggest period I will tell you Captain Kelly I will not be here on the 30th okay uh, I, I will be I can be available on the first if that works for anybody if not then the following Monday or Tuesday 30th um, and we've got okay so we have this the sixth we actually have the budget presentation correct I'm willing I mean I'm willing to work on the first the fourth or the fifth 29th are you available? no I'm, I'm, I'm out, of You're town. out of town yeah, yeah. Um, I apologize I didn't realize you it was did then. I know you didn't know okay sure. and so what is that a Wednesday the 30th well yes. in a perfect world we would have everything done, and Dr. Kane's going to present it to us in that meeting and then present it next week to the public in a perfect world. Yeah. But last year, we needed that last meeting for work, so well, we'll move it to, your, to something that works for you so that you well, don't have to it miss it. it works with all of us. I mean, I yeah, don't want to. Absolutely. No, so no, that's fine. Are you if, you all, if you all need to meet, then go ahead and do it. Right. Don't wait for me. I would rather this get done because it's very important. Well, the, so, I'm, and I I'm can free catch up to, to do speed. it, and I, I believe you are too. But, but uh, Ms. O'Connor... Ms. Morissette are the ones that are... And that's where I'm at. The, Wherever you guys, right. if you want to meet whenever, because I, I'm out of town, that's my fault. Please go ahead and have this meeting because it is very crucial. Well, on the 19th, I'd like to talk about the time that we meet to accommodate work workers. Um, and then, Ms. O'Connor, you have a little flexibility, but once you've got your schedule set, you can't. Yeah, so unfortunately, we can't continue to say, oh, let's go another hour, exactly. let's shift it, because then okay, I have to reschedule right. clients. Right. We won't do try not to do that yes, at all. Too. I appreciate that. Thank My you. question, though, now that we said that, mm -hmm. <laughs> have you already locked in clients on the 30th of January? Um, I can't tell you very quickly without accessing my work calendar, but I can, I have enough time to move them if needed. Yeah, because, so the first would be, um, you, I think everyone could be here first. January 1st. February 1st. February 1st. February 1st. So I have February. a superintendent's Friday. meeting on that one. Okay. Um, okay. And See. usually around that time we are oh. talking about. So Kevin Kelly, just keep it the 30th. Budget. Okay. Yeah. What we'll do, we'll we'll hold it on on the 19th when we talk about timing. Okay. Maybe that we might be able change. to find another date though. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, yeah. don't hold it up for me. I please. understand. Uh, it's too important. And hopefully we'll work so well together we won't have to hold that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna run through this. <laughs> okay. So we'll get back to we'll talk about that again on the 19th. Okay. The and that'll 19th, give you time the 19th, to look at that. Okay. That's a month and for meeting in this room for budget works for the, any of the work we sessions. We do we okay. meet in here. Can I just get a clarification on the, the, what date the date you just set for the end of December? Did you just set a date for the end of d no? No, no. I have. We're talking so the thirtieth of Jan January, January, but January. We the nineteenth is yet. the only day. Okay. I was I was looking at um, February first instead of January thirtieth. So January thirtieth, and what was the time frame? We haven't oh, we haven't settled on that yet because yeah, right. Tammy can't come. So oh, if we can okay. all. So on come. another day, if, that's fine. If not, she's fine with us going ahead and doing the 30th. Okay. We'll talk about it on the 19th. Yeah. I leave for Nebraska on the 19th, but I'll be here. Okay. All right. And then you'll see on the next page, February 6th, uh, is another, is the superintendent will present her recommended budget to us, and that is a formal monthly board meeting. We, we do that in that meeting. The 13th is the budget work session and the 20th of February are scheduled budget work sessions. So um, that's, and the superintendent, they're gonna put not every single, we every single meeting for the rest of the year on there. You see the next thing she has, a, they have a list that, and they're gonna have a link that goes to the whole budget for the year. So we'll, they'll only give us this, the that days and the, the planned meetings um, a couple of months in advance at the most. And then that'll save us save them a little work okay. any questions about the meetings and the superintendent on the website will have a list of the concerts and all things that are up for Christmas time is that right dr. King so I was oh. asking that everybody um, check their school website because the school website generally has the, all of the dates. So Every if, individual school? Individual school. So if I'm a parent of a student at Sutlersville Middle, nice they likely know, but it'll be on Sutlersville Middle's website. Um, since I have Mr. Strait standing here, Mr. Strait, have you ever uh, put dates for all of the school concerts on our homepage? 
I don't I don't think so. And so like for example, something changed at Queen Anne's County High School. We just got the meeting notice. I mean the notice today for one of their concerts. So so we can just parents should check the school website. Okay. And for the board members, um, if you want to look at, at a variety of schools that you might want to go to, that, that would be the best. And look, call up their website. And uh, if you have a certain, you know, if you like to do the concerts or um, I think the high schools always tell us when the um, plays are going on. Mm -hmm. And we try to try to hit those plays if you can. So we just, we, I encourage you all to attend as many things you can, but still... But, but still, you know, do things with your families and all. These are the holidays, and it's hard to, to get too much in. But, but it is wise to, if, if you traditionally go to a Ken Island thing like myself, I would try to go to something in Sellersville, or, you know, and I, I will do the, make a point of going to that school to get their, their event. I, I have a um, point of information. There, is there something going on at the middle schools, December 17th, 18th, and 19th? Because I have not here Centerville Middle, for some reason, Centerville Middle, Mattapeak Middle, and then Stevensville Middle. Isn't that Challenge Day? It, it is. Yeah. is. Okay. It's challenge, challenge Day at each one of the middle schools. Okay. And then Southersville is on the 20th? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and that's in the morning? Yes. And Until 2, I believe. Okay. Okay. Because I have it in here, and I, was, I didn't know what it was for. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Neat. Very neat. Okay. Does anybody have anything else? And again, here. thank you um, for picking me as president and I will try not to let you down. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Oh, I have a motion <laughs> to adjourn the meeting. So, so moved. Second. That's right. Oh, <laughs> Robert, I want to call your name. Carlo? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. Okay. Now the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.